Good evening, model railroaders, and welcome back to the second section podcast where it's just regular guys talking model railroading. I'm your host, Andy Dorsch, and joining me tonight is my co host, Mike Ostertag. Mike, how you doing? I'm out of the can. Thanks a lot You're for out that. Out of the can. Yeah. You're out of the can. I only, hey, put, I'm one, glad... I only put one foot in. There you go. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you made it back. Thanks. Um, because we got a really awesome show tonight. Um, we got a fellow YouTuber in the house. Yeah. Railfan220 is here. Um, his alias is Cam Neely. Cam, welcome to the second section podcast. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I'm I'm super excited to to be here and talk about the layout. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, thank you again for taking the time to to join us. Um, we got um, I don't even know how to say this, but um, I've been following you on YouTube now for over three years, and I've uh, you got a fantastic uh, layout. And I'm glad that you're going to be uh, sharing that with us this evening. But for for those who haven't caught you on YouTube and for the section crew who isn't familiar, would you uh, be so kind as to give an introduction as to who you are, uh, your what you're modeling, your interests, uh, those types of things? Absolutely. Um, so, yep, thanks for the introduction. I'm, I'm Cam Neely. Uh, I am currently living in Indianapolis. Um, and I don't really have an interest in any of the railroading around here. So all of my <laughs> past modeling has, uh, has taken me to points West. And for those, um, who follow me, you, you know, that, uh, I'm currently modeling the BNSF, uh, Marias pass. Um, so it's the, the Western end of the Highline subdivision out in far Northwestern Montana. Um, so I'm really just focusing on, on mainline railroading. That's been an interest of mine for a long time. Um, and yeah, so, uh, I, I think you mentioned it, you've been following me for three years and I think the YouTube channel actually had a, a 10 year anniversary that went kind of unnoticed back in December. So somehow I'm, I'm approaching 11 years on YouTube now and, uh, I, oh, wow. I pray that nobody scrolls all the way back to watch those early. Wait videos. a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> I think we need to go back. Wait a minute. We, we, we need to go way First back. of all, how old are you? I'm 25. So. Um, Do the math, folks. This kid's been doing this for since he's been so 15 have, years old. On you will YouTube? find a kid. If you if you go to those early videos, There there is a child. Wow. For sure. Uh, for and I say it because you're the same age as one of my sons so it's like <laughs> yeah yeah it, it that's incredible man that is so have, awesome. yeah. so have you been doing uh model railroad content on youtube for 10 years or is the channel have, oh my gosh which when you put that into context it's kind of embarrassing the the number of followers i have i should have more i put 10 years of, of work into it so um yeah no i it, and it's evolved so much I think if, if you could like compress the timeline of my modeling on YouTube, um, I would seem exceptionally unfocused because it just looks like I never finish anything and I'm always changing what I'm doing. And that'll be a theme of, of tonight, actually. Um, but I'm excited because I'm I'm finally seeing a project out with this layout. And yeah. uh, it's it's arrived at the point where I'm I'm pleased with it um, and I, I'm happy with where it is at the moment. So um, it's been a journey. And uh, a lot of learning for sure. Um, I, YouTube really kind of thrust me into the, the hobby at uh, a higher level, I think, um, okay. because there's just so much inspiration out there, so many good layouts. So um, I've definitely benefited from social media, uh, namely YouTube. And, and so I try to give back as best as I can by making content. Yeah. Um, so we have just for the section crew and anyone who's catching the replay on this, um, we'll have Cam's YouTube uh, channel linked in the show notes or the description. And uh, make sure that you you check it out. I see that uh, um, Paul Scott August has already subscribed um, as a result of <laughs> of, of uh, bringing yeah. it up on screen tonight. But you're also awesome. you're not just on YouTube. You're you got a Facebook presence as well, correct? 
I do. Yeah. I've got Facebook and Instagram, um, which are, uh, pretty much the, the same, same content there. Um, but that's where I post my, my decent photos. And so, um, yeah, you can find me, I think both of them, if you just search real fan 220, uh, that, that should be the tag. The Facebook page is actually called the BNSF Marias pass or whatever it is. I forgot. Yeah. BNSF uh, Marias pass HO scale layout. There we go. Um, yeah. So, so are you finding, are you finding that Instagram is becoming more and more used through like with your generation of model are you finding like are you having more younger modelers using instagram instead of like youtube or 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 facebook in order to get their stuff out on social media because i know there's a lot of people starting to use instagram for model railroad stuff yeah it's interesting i don't know how to um characterize it because i i took a, a pretty big hiatus um and i was off of pretty much all of my social stuff for um, almost two years where I wasn't keeping up with it. Um, so I, I think like the, the relevance and, and the promotion of my posts kind of took a dent. And so when I came back, I'm actually seeing less, uh, less engagement on Instagram. And I don't know if that's a function of me being away and coming back or if there's been a, a, a shift in the tide towards some other platform. Um, but I got on Instagram because I thought it was there was perhaps a better reach. Um, but interestingly, since coming back, I've gotten a lot more um, engagement on my, my Facebook posts, a lot more comments, a lot of shares and, and a lot of eyes. The, the demographics are certainly different. Like when I look at my posts on Instagram versus Facebook, like that, that age uh, histogram definitely um, shifts. So there's, there's probably like 80% of the people on Instagram are between I don't know, like 15 and, and 35 and then Facebook like that, that, that definitely median age shifts up by a good 20 years and base or YouTube is probably like the most, um, most level. And I also think that YouTube will persist, right? I think Instagram ebbs and flows. Um, it, you know, now we've got TikTok and, and things of that nature. I'm not sure that just because like, it's such a, it's such a niche sort of like format and there's so many other platforms copying it because now we've got reels and, and like you can post photos or videos, but I, I like YouTube as a platform because it'll never go away. Like you can, videos are things that people want to consume and they will always consume them. And the format of the video can evolve, right? I can post a, a three minute video or a 30 second video or a three hour podcast or hopefully not. I, I don't talk that long, but <laughs> well, I'm talking um, about three hour podcast. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a, a 99 slide presentation, but I, I won't get through all those. Yeah, and, then, and we're looking oh, no, oh, you're, I expect to see all 99. Dude. Okay. So well, you, yeah, I'll click through. And this will this will help with your mat, uh, your your uh, master's thesis defense. Uh, the, the the section crude tonight will be your your defense panel that you'll have to go up against. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this is good um, good public practice. Yeah. This is good. This is good public practice. No, that's fan. On on, I mean, it's great. St- stuff cam and um uh, i know that it's it's been fun to follow your journey on 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 social as well just a couple things um before we dive dive into um you know your your content that you have this evening for us um so your ho scale modeler right modeling yep. mariah's pass um has has the layout always been in the same spot um, has it moved around your basement or uh, from place to place, or has it just been a, a a ten year work in progress in that same room? Yeah, and what you said, it's it's been the same spot. It's like not quite half. I'd say like a third of the basement. There's sort of a, a separate room which it itself has uh, evolved as well. That room we've we've actually there's a separating wall. And it yeah. has been raised twice now. So the rooms evolved around the layout and it started as just a <laughs> tabletop, two four by eight tables. Um, that was yeah. my first layout. And actually that's, that's the layout that's uh, on my, my early YouTube page. You can go all the way back. And like the first few years of YouTube was the, the tabletop four by eight L layout. Yeah. Um, and then I jumped straight from that into basically this layout. And as I'll talk about it, it's evolved as well, but um 
yeah, it's been th this layout officially broke ground in like late 2014. So I've actually got a, a logo, hey. which I'll share with you. It's got the got the established date on there. So yeah, it's, it's been in the same spot and it's been uh, what, like eight years now of, of working on it. Oh, that's unbelievable. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Um, Mike, I know I've just been kind of hogging the mic here and asking all these questions. No, and, that's fine. <laughs> um, and then the, the other the other question I just wanted to, to get in there, and I apologize if we covered it um, er, real early on in the intro, but did when, when did you get started in model railroading? Like, were you, um, was it 15? And then it was just, you know, YouTube channel and here we go. Or was it no. something before that? I mean, I, I was brainwashed from a young age um, by my <laughs> grandfather to, to like trains. Um, okay. Yeah. So he he grew up in a small town in Minnesota and at sort of like the diesel steam transition okay. um, era. And there, he just was struck mm -hmm. by the, the motion and sound um, and looks of, of steam locomotives. And like he just got so invested in like the equipment um, locomotive technology, things like that. And so he hung on to that, uh, kind of skipped a generation. My dad wasn't so into it as a, um, as a kid or even most of his adult life. But then I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and he had all sorts of cool locomotive books. And I would spend hours and hours whipping out the like blueprint, blueprint drawings of locomotives and oh, wow. sketching them out. Um, and so my parents, he also had a, a, an HO scale layout in his basement. It wasn't it's still there um it's nothing to write home about and he would admit that too it's just it's an excuse for him to collect equipment it's just a circle basically and he has all sorts of brass steam locomotives and Ooh. a ton of milwaukee road equipment um, uh, there we go yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Dan did his research before coming on the show yeah <laughs> yeah I, I knew what you'd like to hear um yeah, there you go. yeah but so i think just being there uh i had you know, I developed an interest in real trains, of course, but also seeing the scale models was, um, I don't know, that's cool as a kid, right? So I held on to yeah. that. And my, my parents were kind enough that at a, a young age, I don't know when they got me a, I'm trying to remember now, I think it was a Bachman like Amtrak set. And it was probably like a, whatever it is, like a three by six or four by six loop, right? With yeah. just the, the easy track. Um, and so it had an Amtrak F40 PH and some Amfleet cars with it. And that kind of got me started. I think that lived on a, a dining room table for a little bit. And then at some point, I don't know when, um, we started the tabletop layout. And that was like the, the first foray into actual model railroading where we started to like do scenery and glue stuff down and, and have, have a, a permanent layout. So, um, yeah, that's how I got started really. That's, that's really, that's kind of, that's a really cool story. And then just to kind of hear how you've progressed and now to, to the point where you're at, I mean, it's, it's been, like I said, it's been very fun to watch, but it's, it's really cool to see that you've kept that level of engagement, you know, all from the start of, of, of your hobby, you know, through those, those years of, um, I'll, I'll just say where we deviate or wander away from, yeah from the hobby in, in the high school and college years and you've managed to stick with it. And, um, it's, it's paying out in quite a, quite a bit of dividends for you. Uh, Mike, did you, looks like you wanted to jump in there. You got getting the hands going here. <laughs> First of all, when you want to talk Milwaukee road, just come ask me. I'll, I'll be, I got, I know a guy. Yeah. There's, enjoy talking I, with him. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So why the BNSF? Mm. why yeah, um, why the bit why why because you basically model today right you're or mm -hmm. or like more or less yeah more or less modern more modern technology things like because yeah. you mentioned putting up ptc antennas and you you know oh, yeah, you yeah. have the ctc and things like that so i mean that doesn't get much more today than it does <laughs> anything else right so but why the BNSF? Why not the UP or the CSX or NS or or somebody like, you know, well, you did kind of touch on it a little bit. You said nothing really towards Indianapolis really parts yeah. spoke to you and the Western part. So give the argument for why BNSF over the UP. Not that I disagree, yeah, that, with you, but I'm just saying. No, no. Um, 
there's not really a great answer honestly uh that it's it's just been an evolution as well where we talked about it before the show even started but this is where my dad's influence comes into it um so this is a, a hobby that we've shared and that he's uh enabled um i guess is the word <laughs> for it and it encouraged as well um but he he's a graphic designer um by mm. by trade um and so he's always oh, had a fascination nice. in logos and so his railroad expertise or interest is sort of from the perspective of marketing materials. And so he, as a child, always loved um, the Great Northern uh, and in, in particular, the, the Rocky logo, Rocky, uh, the yes. mountain goat. Yep. Correct. Whatever. Got but, it. Um, you got yeah. it. Atta boy. <laughs> um, anyway. Defense one complete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and actually, we'll, we'll take a look at the logo that he designed and, and I'll, I put the two side by side to, to sort of show the comparison there. But so that, I think he always had an allegiance towards that railroad. And given that that's BNSF heritage, um, he of all the modern railroads really likes the, the BNSF uh, heritage three or swoosh logo. And so one of the, the first locomotives that he purchased to enable me um, was a uh, heritage three Atherton AC 4400. And I've, always had that. And so there've been points in time um, when I was thinking about, you know, this layout, the project that, that I'm going to show you. Once I knew that I had um, the space to, to make a layout, I, I wasn't sold on BNSF. There are actually times when I thought it'd be cool to model um, the Pocahontas district, uh, NS, you know, helper grades out in yep. West Virginia. Um, like the salute, but, like the uh, salute grade type stuff, like like those. Yeah, things? I yeah, all of that. I, I was really just looking at prototype examples of um, big mountain grades and and really focusing on helper operations. I was sort of like I was I was seeking inspiration uh, for this layout project, and so I wasn't initially sold on BNSF, but um, we just kind of floated back to that, um, and I'll talk about it. But eventually, I landed on the the Crawford Hill prototype, which was sort of version one of the layout that um that i currently have and so a, a winding answer but really it, it started with an interest in the great northern logo and then a modern uh, appreciation for the bnsf paint scheme and logo from my dad and then from there i just like i i think i began to appreciate the the western railroading a bit more just from a scenic perspective and so i gravitated towards that and mm. BN, the reason I picked BNSF is because the Crawford Hill prototype presented itself to me. And I thought that was a really cool um, manned helper district or manned helper operations. Yeah. And, and I just, I settled on that, but there's so many other examples out there. My, my good friend, John Caffarelli, he models the uh, um, Union Pacific Cascade subdivision out in Oregon, another mm. great manned yep. helper uh, operation. So there's a lot of good examples. Um, I just, I landed on Crawford Hill and that sort of, sent me down the, the BNSF path. Do you still have your first engine? I do. Yeah. Does oh, it cool. work? Does it still work? No, no it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty beat up and it's missing an engine. And I think at the moment, a, a truck, I, I've definitely, uh, yeah, it, it's been, it's been used for parts. We'll say. <laughs> yeah. She's a parts queen now. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. That's, that's perfect. A, that's a fantastic <laughs> introduction. Um, thanks Cam and, and Mike, that was really cool. Um, I do want to kick it over to the, to the section crew in the chat tonight, almost a hundred of us out there this evening. Um, so I just want to say if you have questions for Cam about, uh, the content or anything that we discuss here tonight, make sure you get those in the chat. I'll bring those up as we go through his, um, I guess we'll call it a presentation this evening about his railroad. Um, and then just remember, keep the discussion about modeling, keep it civil. We got some folks out there with little blue wrenches by their name. They're the moderators. Um, so if you get out of line, I've given them the authority to give you the stanky boot. So make sure that you're minding your P's and Q's. Um, I should make an announcement right now is what I and should. And Mike is going to make an announcement. This is news to us this just in uh, no it's not it's not news to you <laughs> <laughs> all right so we haven't done the short line of the show for quite a while um i've been deep into research i just 
did a bunch of other research on it. It will be back next show. Alive and well. And bigger and better than, than ever. So look for that for next show. Uh, I'm I want to apologize to everybody for taking such a hiatus with it, but um, you know, not going to use summertime as an excuse, but I mean, we've all been kind of a little bit busy, but uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's going to be really, really cool. And um, so just to let everybody know that the short line of the show is not dead. It's going to be, it's going to be coming back and uh, it'll be back next show without fail um and i think the same goes for the what's on your workbench too we haven't done that for a while have yeah, we'll we be bringing those back after yep. this show in full force so get ready for what's on yep. your workbench and all that fun stuff too right it's, Mike? it's getting to be modeling season right it's yeah. starting modeling season starts soon so uh start getting your stuff ready get your your uh your your short and I want suggestions. Start looking at the alphabet by state. I want your suggestions after Missouri for railroads that we could be doing the rest of the time. So uh, I already have several that I've gotten that I'm seriously considering. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting off that easy. Yeah, okay, whatever. But it it's uh, it's. Uh, I want to hear what your suggestions are because that that would be really really cool. That makes yeah. it a lot easier to figure it out, and it gives you guys something to you know. Yeah, and you can you can email those suggestions to us at secondsectionpodcast at gmail .com. So we have been getting a, a handful. Um, so I'll make sure to get those forwarded over to to Mike um, as Good. as we get them fed into us. Somebody just asked what the next state is. Uh, whatever's after missouri missouri is next and <laughs> rough it, how's the work on layout been so we'll look it up and we'll figure it out yep very good so i think uh model railway back shop says rail fan 220 how's the work on the layout ben and i think that's a perfect segue into uh the presentation and uh, potential thesis defense that uh, you're going to be <laughs> you're going to be going. Do we need a backstory on, on the thesis defense comment? I do mean, it's a pretty. I don't know. That maybe Cam. Do you want to share with the? You want to share world? with that a little bit, Cam? Well, well, yeah. It's twofold. So I'm I'm finishing a uh, master's degree in geology, and I'm putting finishing touches on my thesis, and I'll have to defend that here in the next month or so. Um, but also, I'm an exceptionally long-winded person, and um, the presentation, I, I don't want to call it a presentation, because if we keep calling it a presentation, I will present, and if I do, it, it will be far more than the equivalent master's thesis defense, so um, there's <laughs> lots of photos and lots of things to talk about, so yeah, just don't don't let me run wild too much, because I'll just no, keep talking. We'll, we'll interrupt you rudely and often. Um, with questions and, and all that good stuff, and we'll allow you to take uh, breaks and breaths. So you should be you should be good to go. So Cam, I'm going to go ahead and bring it up on screen. Um, yeah. And let's see here. I'm going to just kick it over to you. We're going to shut up for a little bit, right, Mike? Sure. Cool. As long as I can. <laughs> yeah. No, and I again, it, it it is not a presentation. I tried to put photos in here in some sort of like vague logical manner um, or order. So I can I can talk about it if I need to, but please jump in at any point with questions. There, there is no proper order. Um, so yeah, I mean, we covered it. I am modeling uh, modern day BNSF uh, over the Highline subdivision out in Western Montana and specifically focusing on the Western grade of Marias Pass. Um, so this is the grade that, that climbs in the eastbound direction and crests at the Continental Divide. And so the photo you see here is on my layout, a place called Blacktail, um, which is an actual railroad name place uh, along the line um, within what's referred to sometimes as the shed district. So there's a number of snow mm. sheds on the line. And so that's what we're seeing here. And this is a structure uh, that you see in the background there that 
I just put on the layout um, within the last week and I've been adding some details. So uh, there actually, as of tonight, I've made some updates to the scene. And if we get to those photos, I'll, I'll talk about that. But this is probably like the one of the more put together uh, scenes on the layout at the moment. Um, so I figured this would be a, a good slide to start with. And I think that's the photo you chose for the uh, thumbnail tonight. So yeah, I did. I, good. It's really impressive. I uh, appreciate it. And I see someone asked if this is freelancer prototype. So it, um, it's, it's kind of both as it always is. Uh, I'm making an effort to model prototypically, right? So the structure you see here, that shed in the background, um, it's inspired from actual prototype photos. And I kind of tried to, to take measurements um, from those photos. So there's a degree of prototypical realism in terms of the, the structures that I'm trying to capture in the sequence of locations on my layout. Um, but obviously there's a lot of artistic license that you, you have to employ with a layout like this and, and especially a layout that didn't start as this. I'll talk about that in a second, but this layout, um, the actual bench work and, and mainline orientation and all that was set in stone for a different prototype. And so there have been some changes made, um, but, but because of that, there's, there's also some, uh, some limitations and some creative license that I had to use. Um, so I already covered this, but really the, the point of my layout is modeling mainline operations, modern mainline operations. So focusing on road freights, um, but we're not neglecting the switching. There is a, a yard on the layout and there is um, some industry switching as well. Here, we got um, to jump in real quick because um, that's what I questions do. Questions are coming fast questions and furious coming, already. Questions oh, are coming in. Um, so Relatable 100 says, it's is it uh, too early, too late to ask about the ballast, <laughs> uh, scenery, and rock material and brands? So um, oh. let us know what you're going to be covering um, in, in, in the present, or I'll just say in the picture um, gathering this evening. And, and what can you share with Relatable? on that yeah i i'm happy to touch on all of that um i was basically going to go through the layout history and then uh talk about like what version one of this layout was um before returning back to the current version and then i was really i just have a collection of, of photos scene by scene where i kind of talk about my process and the things that i focused on as i rebirthed this layout um so i do talk about inspiration for colors that's, that's something that i focus on heavily was um keeping a sort of a, consi a consistent and coherent style throughout the the layout and that starts with um colors but also materials used so to answer that question um about ballast i'm using scenic express number 50 blended gray ballast for the main mm. line um because I think that looks pretty close to me to the uh, sort of that the dark gray and basalt kind of style ballast that you get along the, the old Great Northern up there in Western Montana. Um, but I also use a lot of Arizona rock and mineral products, uh, rock powders and, and things of that nature for dirt and right of way stuff. So you can see even in this photo, there's some like reds and, and darker grays and browns and stuff off to the side of the main line. And that's, that's a blend of numerous Arizona rock and mineral powders, as well as um, I use sanded grout for my dirt. And then I tone the sanded grout with, um, with uh, tempera, powdered tempera paint. So I've got like black, oh, red, cool. yellow, and I just kind of mix it in there to darken it, to lighten, to, to change the shade, things like that. So that's sort of inspired by um, the, uh, the zip texturing method of, of uh, who is it? Joe Fugate, did he? I think he uh, yeah, sort he, of pioneered he's, that. He's penned it a few times in his in his yeah. uh, magazine. That's for sure. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so that's really interesting. And we're we're talking about rocks right off the bat. Geology, uh, of course, being, <laughs> being your foray in in education. Did that have any bearing? I mean, because your rock work looks ridiculously good. Are you using some of your, uh, I guess, uh, education training to help out with coloring and textures and those types of things? 
I wish I was. I think most <laughs> of that is just like modeling instinct. Um, I, I have a horrible, horrible understanding of hard rock geology. I, my undergraduate degree is in anthropology. So I, I can tell you a little bit about archaeology and cultural anthropology, but I can't tell you anything about rocks. And my, my academic or professional understanding of geology is sort of in, in climate reconstructions using lake sediment of all things. So I don't know, I don't know a lot about rocks. I know how to look at pictures though. And so I tried to, I, I, I tried to employ those skills in uh, finding inspiration for, you know, how to render the rocks on my layout. Okay. That was a really good and honest answer. We, we probably wouldn't have known if you would have taken credit for it. <laughs> appreciate you it. You could I'm have glad. just said I'm yes. And you could have said yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go to yeah, school. I can tell you geology. when they all formed too. Yeah. Yeah. There you um, go. Right. <laughs> no, How many I have, I have no idea. Um, yeah. So anyway, the, I don't know. Hopefully I'm not missing any questions, but this no, is a I'm map writing line. them down too, Cam. So I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure that we'll get them out there. Go yeah, ahead. I see someone's already interested in, in trees, so I'll, I'll talk about there. that too, but I can't, get there. I can tell you that I, I stole those from Grant Eastman. He's got a great video on his Southern Alberta <laughs> Rail uh, YouTube page, so um, there's there's methods out there for that, and I'll, I'll touch on that later too, but just background, I'm still introducing the layout in its current state, um, modeling uh, Mariah's Pass from Whitefish, which is there sort of in the middle of the page, uh, up to summit basically um so it's really only uh, a short stretch of the highline subdivision um so on the far western edge of the subdivision is whitefish and that's where we have the yard on the layout so that's the the lowest elevation the lowest point on the layout and then basically it's a continuous climb um, up through columbia falls through uh west glacier or belton as it's called by the railroad and then essex and ultimately Mariah Summit. All those scenes that I just mentioned are um, on the layout. And there's a lot, of course, that's missing because there's a fair degree of compression um, to model all that in 200 feet of HO scale mainline. Um, but of interest, and I'll show the, the track plan at some point too, there is no helix on the layout. I get a lot of questions about that, but it's just oh, a continuous yeah. climb from- Ooh, I like top. that. <laughs> it, and that was, a, that was a design decision that was scale specific. If I were modeling N scale, I probably could have crammed and would have crammed a helix in there. Um, but with HO scale, it was either helix or peninsula. Like those are the options um, just because of the, the size mm. of the room. So I chose the, uh, the latter. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share an embarrassing fact with the section crew. I had no idea that this line followed the southern border of Glacier National Park. Yep. So there, there's the answer to Mike's question. Like he was asking why BNSF, but I can tell you why this line instead of what I was modeling. And it's just because it's beautiful. Like yeah. I, I had the, the privilege to do a bit of rail fanning along here and as well as visit Glacier National Park. And yeah. I just love Western Alpine forests and uh, high altitude streams and like the Middle Fork Flathead River, you can uh, white water raft down it. I have not done that, but just like the the vistas are incredible. So it's it's fantastic railroading. Um, so I, I apologize for this the diversion here, but um, are you a, a national park aficionado? Like, do you do you um, or is it just this particular one? Because I'm going to, this is a personal question for myself. I, I love national parks, this, that, and the other. And I, I've never been to Glacier. Would you highly recommend it or is it, I, is it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. I, um, I wouldn't call myself a, a park aficionado. I want to be like, it's, it's mm. not that I'm not interested. I just have not, I've, I've had the, the privilege of visiting a number of them on trips with my family or rail fanning trips, whatever it is. Sure. Um, and honestly, I've become more of an outdoors person through my uh, geology program. There's a lot of field work that we have to do and sometimes scenic and sometimes horrible locations. Uh, and it's never fun. It's always hard work. But getting outside and, and like wading through water and all that has really made me appreciate the, uh, the scenery a lot more. So um, Glacier is awesome. I feel like it's accessible. Like some of the, the crazy views and photos that you see, like you can just see that driving up the uh the, the main road there i forget what it's mm. called something something to the sun road 
Um, okay. Yeah, it's awesome. Is is Essex? Isn't Essex where that hotel is? Where that Great yep. Northern I, Hotel is? Yeah, I got to stay there. Um, when the one I visited, that just got so. sold, right? It just got sold to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the I Isaac of, Walton? Yeah, the yep, Isaac, Isaac Walton. Walton thing. It's right here, actually. Um, this inset here is showing Essex. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, yep. And so there's there's a little yard and a, a Y there. And then the Amtrak station's around the corner, but um, there's also a, a old, basically crew hotel that's been repurposed uh, as just a, a regular uh, visitor hotel. And then they have the uh, the locomotive lodge there, Great Northern 441, old F45 locomotive that you can stay in, as well as um, a number of caboose lodges that have been gutted and, and fitted with, uh, I guess, beds and whatever else in there. Really? So, um, That's interesting. Yeah, cool property. I, I wanted to model some of those features. Um, I'll, you know, I'll get to it later. But there just there isn't really space on the layout to do that. But if if I were to model this line again, I think I'd I'd find a way to include some of those features that I think most people, or not most, but many people who are familiar with the line, think of. Like when you say Marias Path, they're like, oh, the Isaac Walton Inn. Like I've either stayed there, or visited it, or whatever. So, um, yeah, really cool place. I hope mm -hmm. they don't screw it up because I know it changed hands. And there's a lot of unhappy people. They were selling off all sorts of old railroad memorabilia. And so I think there's concerns about what they're going to do to the inside of it. But um, I'm sure it'll be fine. Hmm. Anyway, uh, geez, can't believe I'm still introducing the current layout. But here it is, basically. Um, there's <laughs> there's some updates, right? There's supposed to be a snow shed here. You saw that in the opening slide. But it's, it's double deck. It's modern BNSF. Uh, we run, you know, trains with distributed power. There's a little bit of switching on the lower level. You can see that there. And actually on the bottom of the photo, you can see uh, that's the, the snow shed in progress. I've got it on the, oh. the cutting mat there. So that's before it was all put together, probably a couple of weeks ago. But All um, right. I got a question already. Go back. <laughs> <and> yeah. <laughs> what is the height difference between the head end of that train and the rear of that train? Ooh, uh, good question. Well, I, it I looks like it's like plans. four inches almost. No, it look. I think the photos always make it look really dramatic, like almost unrealistic. When you're standing in the room, it it just it's a steep grade, but it's not like absurd. Um, so there's a bit of forced perspective here, but it probably it probably is about four inches because right about where the the head end is there to the right. Um, I did some bad math and like the grade that was supposed to be around two percent probably bumps up closer to three percent but only for a short bit so like basically to the like the apex of the turn back curve there dead center in the photo it the yeah. grade kind of levels out again and then it goes back to like maybe two two point two percent but there is there is a bit there where it's like really steep and then on top of that the train's going through a, a big 180 degree plus curve and so that's a lot of friction and a lot of gravity um, so we do use helpers on the line, just like the, the prototype does from time to time. So about how many cars do you usually have on a typical train? I mean, like this is coming around a curve. I mean, it looks like what, maybe yeah. about 15, 20? Yeah, this is, that's a 26 car train there, um, which is pretty standard. I, I don't have super long trains. Obviously I'd like them to be longer um but there's two limiting factors one of them is money and the other is how much space <laughs> there is on the layout so the the layout is only uh i say only it's like i am so lucky to be able to play with this space and just for clarity because i'm not going to pretend that this is my house or whatever this is a project i started almost 10 years ago um with the blessing of my parents and they said yes we will allow you to screw up uh, almost half of our finished basement. Um, so all thanks to them. Um, and so this, this is not my space. And most people do not have the opportunity to even plan a layout like this. Um, so I acknowledge that it's, it's awesome and, and large. And it is a big project for a single person. But there are many, many layouts out there that are much larger. So because it's only 12 by 28 feet, I say only again, um, there's not an HO scale. That's like, I can't run 50 car trains, right. That takes up like half of the upper level. Uh, right. so I'm, I'm using a, a pretty significant scaling factor. And that's something that I've kind of toyed with and tweaked recently. Another thing that, um, 
was inspired by Grant Eastman. He uses the 40% rule. So yeah. I basically use the HO scale equivalent of that. So this 26 car train, um, if, if you're just counting cars, is the equivalent to basically a 118 car prototype train is how I, I run things. And so the, the mile posts are set to that scaling factor as well. Um, as are like siding lengths and things like that. So I list them in my my like paperwork timetable and it'll say this siding here is, I forget what it is, but it's probably like 8,000 feet or 9,000 feet, something like that, scale feet, right? Um, <laughs> but it, it wouldn't even be like an actual scale feet that's probably like 1,500 feet, right? So it, it, there's, there's yeah. some multiplication going on, not only in car count, but also distance. That is so cool. So one quick um, question from Sparky 107, 107. He says, uh, Cam, your dad helps out a lot or uh, mostly just you now? Yeah, so he, he's, he's helped uh, a lot. Um, I think, you know, he spent a fair bit of time early on helping with the, the bench work and things like that. Once it got time to sort of make stylistic choices um, and scenery and things like that, it's, it's pretty much been me with, his input, obviously, like we chat about things, talk about things, uh, share photos and inspiration and, and go on rail fanning trips and all that. But um, I think he's in a way almost been hesitant to step on my toes and like he knows what he's doing, but I don't think he wants to go down to the layout and just like start plopping down grass because he doesn't necessarily know what what vision I have in my head for a certain section. So um, he's obviously supportive and involved in all that. But for the most part, this this has all been um my project um cool. yeah a good, good that's question. cool um yeah and i see also someone is asking what the the separation between the levels is uh it it's sort of it ebbs and flows because it's a continuous climb um so the upper level mirrors the lower level but because the lower level is climbing to get to the upper level, the upper level also then has to climb, right? So there's a reverse loop on each end of the layout. Um, and you know what? I don't want to give too much away. We'll, we'll get to the track plan, but... Um, <laughs> but You're doing the, great. The lower, <laughs> yeah, you're the killing it, man. <laughs> is, is 38 inches at the lowest point. So that's the yard and whitefish. And then the, the upper most section of mainline on the upper level is 66 inches. So it's about a 28 inch climb from bottom to top. Um, but generally I'd say there's probably like 16 inches, I think of separation between levels. It'll change here and there. Like sometimes it might be 14, other times 18, but I think I think I shot for 16 uh, upper to lower level distance. Okay. Wow. It's pretty slick. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna that get the the meat and potatoes of this. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the intro. All right. Um, okay. So I think a lot of people became familiar. Not a lot of people. Let me backtrack. Uh, people who are familiar with my layout, many of them joined and started following the layout when it was the Plains Division layout. Um, and so this is the layout. More or less, it evolved right in this time frame. But when this layout uh broke ground in 2014 um it you know it was born as the plains division layout and i was really focusing on modeling crawford hill um so that's what you see here on the upper level that is a line out in western nebraska northwestern nebraska it is a yep (laughs) it's a uh it's unique because like nebraska is not mountainous right or at least we don't think of it as that um and honestly there aren't even that many trees in a lot of nebraska especially like the sand hills um but in northwestern nebraska you kind of have like an extension of, of the black hills of south dakota dipping into the state and there's a really cool mountain grade out there in nebraska where coal um heading east out of the powder river basin climbs up a sustained one point five five percent grade and so there's a lot there's multiple uh big uh horseshoe curves and and so the the grades are steep the tonnage is high and the curves are in all you know in sort of relative terms they're tight and so they use helpers manned helpers on on every coal train that that heads up the line and so that when i was thinking about prototypes that i wanted to model that's why i chose that um because i just 
think that manned helper operations are the coolest thing in uh, in modern railroading. It is actually pretty interesting. Yeah, and and one of the reasons that I was so interested in that is, uh, you know, I guess way back when now, almost like ten years ago, when I became familiar with John Parker's Fall River Division, um, that I'm sure most people are familiar with. Uh, he uses manned helper operations on his layout and it was just, it was super cool to watch that in, in sort of a model form. And that got me, that got the ball rolling. And I was like, wait, they do this on the prototype. And then I started like researching and trying to find examples of that. Um, and again, Crawford Hill just, just called to me for some reason. Um, and ironically, when I came across this operation on this HO scale layout, uh, that turned into modeling Crawford Hill. But this photo here that I'm showing on the left, that is a part of John Parker's layout that is heavily inspired by Marias Pass, which I model now. So you can actually see mm. one of his snow sheds in the background. And he sent me photos of that snow shed that I used to, to help construct the one um, that I just installed That's on the layout. Cool. So kind of full circle there. Um, yeah. And so here's here's the layout and inspiration side by side on the right is oh, that's cool. kind of as, as far as it got. And then this on the left is um, the upper horseshoe curve of Crawford Hill. So there's some really cool multi-tiered or like terraced sandstone cuts. Um, it's like very manicured and modern looking, um, really wide track spacing. And you can see on the left, uh, main there on the prototype photo, there's a helper set drifting down grade. On the right, there's a manned helper set pushing on the rear of a loaded coal train. So it's just like manned helpers up, manned helpers down all day, um, and just a, a really cool operation. And, and so that's what I wanted to capture. And, and you can kind of see where what I was going for um, on the layout there on the right. That's really good, Cam. Really, that's, really good. That's really awesome. Appreciate it. Um, and, you know, we'll get into it, but there's a lot of things I, I didn't really like about this. Um, and this is obviously an in-progress photo. You can see there's no ballast down or anything. Uh, but I think I had convinced myself that that was as many trees as I was going to install there. And, like, in hindsight, I don't know what I was thinking because it just doesn't look right at all. If there's, like, 12 trees there. Um, but you, you also, like, I think as a, as a modeler, you are sometimes in denial of how much something actually takes like how many trees it really takes to do something and so at this point like when i was putting these trees in i i was like probably this is probably mm. seven six seven years ago even um and like i'm 25 so i was younger at that point right and i i think yeah. i i would quit earlier then uh and now i'm slightly more insane and i i wouldn't settle for that <laughs> Yeah, but it's all part of the process, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's the disease is, is sinking in now. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. look at forward. look at Mike Rose. What did Mike Rose say he had in that one scene? Like almost a thousand trees and one sixteen hundred trees, sixteen hundred oh, trees, and, and they were all super trees. They weren't like clumps. They were all super is trees. This, so. Is this the Conrail layout? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was thumbing through a little bit of that. That is insane. He's got like an actual forest. Like some of those photos, it's just like yeah. big full-sized human beings in a miniature forest. Yeah. Um, yeah. That just goes on and on. Yeah. That, I, I, I don't know if I have it in me to do that. Um, <laughs> I, I'd Not be modeling yet. pretty na narrow, uh, narrow shelves to cut out as many trees as possible. <laughs> make a I'd, I'd make an awesome backdrop but i'm not i'm not modeling those trees um but anyway so don't know why i included these because you can't even see it but there's a satellite image here on the left uh, of the line and so you can really see sort of on like the bottom third of that image on the left there's there's like most of the trees that are in nebraska um all concentrated in that little area and then the line goes up and you can see it there's two pretty cool horseshoe curves there and I yeah. kind of zoomed in on it on the right. So there's a lower horseshoe curve up at the top of the image. Um, and then it gets into the upper horseshoe curve. And then there's a, there's another turn back curve that's often referred to as breezy point. And what was nice about this prototype is that it kind of, in a way, looks like a model railroad in terms of an aisleway and a peninsula. And so I thought I could incorporate that pretty easily um, into my layout. And so here's another perspective of that mm -hmm. upper horseshoe curve. You get yeah. the, this is a, 
a westbound empty train heading down the grade. So in the far distance is the head end and you got the rear end over here to the left. This is standing up on top of one of those giant cuts. Um, and then this is a, a wide angle photo I took way back when during construction of the layout um, showing sort of the, the upper horseshoe curve element there. So the photo I showed uh, a few minutes ago of like the, this here, that back wall that you see in this photo is where I was, there was actually a hole in the wall for um, constructing the upper reverse loop. That's where I was taking this photo. So kind of looking out into the layout room. Wow. That's cool. It's a neat perspective. Um, yeah. So just a few more photos. Like this is 2021. So this is about when like I, I took a break from modeling and that wasn't for any particular reason other than just like life getting in the way and getting a little burned out and disillusioned with the the, the layout and, and the prototype that i was modeling and so this is kind of the these scenes as you see them is where version one of the layout kind of ended up um and yeah just more photos this is the top of the grade at, at belmont nebraska this is where the manned helpers cut off on the prototype um and yeah, here's the the track plan as it was intended. This is the upper level. So we show, or I'm showing here at the at the top, this is the lowest portion of the um sorry, of the the upper level. And so there's Crawford, Nebraska there. There's a, a grain elevator or was, uh, as well as some interchange tracks. And then you can see the the elements that I tried to incorporate. So on the far left hand side of this plan is that lower horseshoe curve, and then you get into the upper horseshoe curve, and then sort of that peninsula set up but it, it's kind of <clears throat> inverted um from the prototype so hmm. um and now here is the conundrum this is the lower level and the lower level was never given any thought the whole impetus for building this layout was crawford hill on the upper level which was this track plan here the lower level was like whatever it can be anything it's just i want it to have a yard and i want there to be some industry switching but that was kind of all the thought I gave it. And in terms of prototypes that I could have picked, Crawford Hill may have been one of the worst because if you, this is the, you know, the upper level Crawford Hill, the grade climbs eastbound. So if you head west or downgrade from here, in other words, to the lower level on the prototype, there's really nothing railroad west of there that would neatly fit into the idea that I had for the lower level, which is I need to support this mainline operation with some switching. So I want there to be yard and I want there to be um, some industries, but you kind of have to go a ways until there's really anything obvious to model. Um, and so really early versions of the layout, I I don't know why, but I, I was like, I'll just model like basically the Twin Cities. So that was gonna be North Town Yard um, oh. in, yeah which it, it would be a t tiny rendition of North Town Yard and then just some like loosely inspired industries um, in sort of the, the Twin Cities area. But that makes no sense. Like if you look at a, a map of the US, if the upper level, which is the, the top of the grade is in Western Nebraska and the lower level that you climb through to get to the upper level is in like Minnesota, and you're heading east that doesn't work out like it makes no sense and i don't know why i did that but i just like i didn't care at the time i was like whatever operationally it doesn't really need to make sense i just want to like model some cool scenes but over time that really bothered me um and, and that's why ultimately i decided to switch so uh, the lower level as you see it here this is still of the previous iteration of the layout so this is layout version one towards the end i decided to model um, a little tiny bit of Mariah's Pass. So I called the yard Whitefish and I called the industry area Columbia Falls and then the, the scene on the other side of the peninsula. Um, here it's labeled Conkelly, Montana. There's a cool canyon scene and um, it's more or less uh, that that has stayed the same on the, the new iteration of the layout. But this has evolved even further and it's become more um, prototypically accurate. And the reason I switched to Montana is because the only reason is that it's west of Nebraska. And like, there's a yard there, there's some industry switching, it's cool scenery, but at least it's west of Nebraska. And it makes sense to head from Montana 
to Nebraska in the eastbound direction. But there's another but. The focus <laughs> operationally of the layout is moving coal and helper operations for moving coal. And coal comes from, for the most part, the Powder River Basin, right? In Wyoming mm -hmm. or even some coal fields in eastern, not eastern Montana, but just Montana in general, which is in the exact middle of my layout. So if you have a loaded coal train on the lower level, it would have to be heading east, which almost never happens um, over this section of, of prototype railroad. Um, so that still bothered me. It's like I have two levels of layout that are now on either side of the Powder River Basin, and it makes no sense operationally for trains to move in a single direction with the same loads. And so just really bad planning, and, and that, that bothered me a lot. Um, so here's some final photos of, of where the layout ended up. Um, here's the upper level at Crawford. Below it is, is Whitefish, Montana. Still layout version one from a few years ago. And then here's the yard. And then this is the, the canyon scene that has evolved, but is, is largely incorporated into the, uh, the current version of the layout. <laughs> um, so again, here, here's my problem. This was paperwork that I made for the, so for version one of the layout highlighted in orange are the two subdivisions that I was modeling and all the coal is pretty much loaded out in the, the Northeast corner of Wyoming there. Um, so trains that are moving eastbound over the Highline subdivision up in Western Montana, they're, they're going to be empty. Um, so you can ignore that if you want, but like that just bothered me over time. The real, the biggest issue I had is that like, I don't have a huge layout. I was kind of going for like a John Parker sort of vibe. I was like, oh, I want to have a sense of moving from a pla one place in the country to another. And I thought to achieve that, I should model two very disparate locations. But if you're not modeling the, the passage of, of distance or of space between those two locations, then you're, you don't really capture the sense of, of distance, of, of traveling. Um, and so really, ironically, I came to realize that the best way to achieve that sense of moving through space is to focus more locally and to have a more continuous section of mainline. In other words, use both levels of the layout to model the same section of, of mainline. Um, hmm. And so that's, that's how I got to the current version of the layout. And, and that's when I said, okay, at the lower level is the, the very, very far Western end of the Highline subdivision in Montana using the, uh, the yard there in Whitefish and heading East until you get to basically like West Glacier. And then I said, let's scrap the upper level and turn it into the rest of the climb to the top of the continental divide, um, that would then complete, uh, the the western grade of Marias Pass in one layout. So that was that's kind of the uh, the evolution of, of how we got to where I am now. I have a question. I have a question. Cam, we gotta unpack a whole ton of we stuff. Here, man. Ton of stuff here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let let's let the guys out in the chat get some pack some of this first. Yeah, I mean we're gonna I just sent I just sent them a cue. So let's Mike go ahead with your question. Let's tee, tee it up here. <clears throat> All right. So you had separatist anxiety going on for a while. <laughs> I guess that's the yeah. best way I could say it. So then why why not stick with going the other direction in like through the other side of the climb in Nebraska then? I mean <laughs> you know you know what I mean? So instead of going all the yeah. way up to Montana, why not if you had the one side of the climb? in in nebraska what yeah. was there anything on the opposite side of that that you could have gone after that would have been like giving you a similar a similar um like a a, a similar modeling opportunity or more more operations yeah. there i'm sure there is if i did better research um so to be clear the it was the upper level of my layout that's modeling that eastbound climb uh, of Crawford Hill, and so once you reach the top of the grade, that that's like the end of my layout. There's no more layout. There's a reverse loop there. Um, so you're right. I could have continued like I could have continued modeling this line out west, like further down the grade, right? Um, 
for the lower level, but there wasn't much opportunity I saw to do that. And if I were to do it again, like, um, in other words, if I were to tackle a Crawford Hill layout, like I was attempting to for version one of this layout, um, I would do what you're saying and make the lower level just more, more sections of, of the main line west of Crawford. So like on the track plan or even here, right? So here's, here's yeah. a grain train on the upper level. It is right. coming westbound through Crawford, Nebraska right now. And then that's the end of the upper level when it goes past the camera, basically. And it'll drop down to the lower level where then magically you're transported to early on. It was going to be Minnesota, which makes no sense. And then later <laughs> on, it, it was going to be Montana. And so what you're saying is is right. And I, I would do this now. I would I would forget that I needed to model a, a flat switching yard or that I needed to model some industry, I would have just focused on what I was focusing on. And that is uh, manned helper operations and mainline road freights. And I would have just continued the grade west of Crawford and tried to pick some cool locations and um, aspects of that, uh, of the Black Hill subdivision, basically, uh, west of there. But no, my I, other part of the question I've got for you is, did you ever consider doing the Powder River Basin on the BNSF? I wish I had. I feel like it, it popped into my mind because I remember, I forget who modeled it, but there's a really cool kind of like portable end scale uh, Orin subdivision layout um, that I thought was super cool. Uh, and so that kind of got me thinking about modeling the Powder River Basin. Um, there's, a, there's a few pretty significant grades out there and there are helpers yeah. and, and really cool, you know, like four track yeah, quad track that. and yeah, quad yeah. track in some spots. I mean, it was good. At that, that's, but there, you have a big chunk of kind of intermingled UP BNSF. It's kind of all, yeah, it kind of gets away from that kind of, that would have kind of gotten away from like what you were talking about earlier on with how you came to, <clears throat> to be with the BNSF stuff. Right. Yeah. And I, I think I'm sure I considered that obviously never seriously because I don't have any recollection of like drawing up a track plan for it, even like sketching one. But I think I would have been scared of of being able to capture that in the space that I had because I, I would have mm. thought on some level that, well, now it would have been cool, but now I would want to model a coal loadout operation as well, like have one of those loops and um, on top of that have yeah. four tracks yeah. and like the limitation of my layout and this is another scale dependent issue is like i have to drop down to a single track main line in a couple places because of the way that the peninsula is um situated and it sounds crazy because it's like what's the difference that you know four inches is going to make if you if you add uh, another main track next to the one that you have on um, where's the track plan like here you can see on either side of the the peninsula are some pretty significant pinch points right down there at the end of the turnback curve. And there's one section of mainline where it, all it is, is it's a shelf that's wide enough to fit a single track. Basically, if mm -hmm. I add a second track next to that, all of a sudden that pinch point, like I, I can't even fit through it. And this is one of the like least accessible layouts to human beings that's ever been built because of those <laughs> two pinch points there. And so if I lost those four inches, like nobody'd be able to operate. Um, and because of that, I, I think I would have been hard pressed to model a quadruple main line or even a double main line all the way and yeah. the prototype uh crawford hill is two main lines all the way up the grade um so that's that's something i even compromised from a prototypical perspective just to cram it into the space fair enough man that's that's beyond a reasonable explanation as to how you're <laughs> you doing I, mean, I i tell you what it, it's really interesting to see because because and it was mentioned before in the chat and we'll get into this a little more later but the photography that you've done has made with these pictures makes your layout look so much bigger than it actually is and yep. that really kind of gives a sense of perspective to how do I want to say this, Andy? I, I know what I'm trying to say. It's you, you, it, your photography lends itself to having more room than what you really do. 
Yeah. And and so your sense of compression is really well done. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's like next level type good. Yeah, I appreciate it. It it definitely yeah, I think it shocks some people. I haven't had that many operating sessions here and and honestly not that many people have, have even seen the layout, uh, whether for operating or, or just a, a visit on the side. And I think most people when they show up are probably surprised by the size of it because on YouTube, if you watch a video, I think it looks bigger than it actually is. And in my photos, like most of the time I'm framing it and I'm using, uh, you know, a, a narrow aperture to extend the scene. It, it looks bigger than it actually is. Um, it's hard in, with a photo to like step back from the layout just because of the nature of it. And it's actually something that I've, I've come to dislike about the layout. If I, again, if I were to use this exact same space and redesign this layout, there would not be a peninsula. Like there's just not enough space in there to like enjoy yourself with other people in the room. It's fun to operate. And I think you can get into it and immerse yourself in, in the operations, but just like the frustration of having to pass by people at these pinch points, there's, it's really actually quite small. Um, and so, yeah, to your, to your so, point, I think I try okay. to, avoid that with the photography and with the videos and all that are those one foot squares or two foot squares uh two foot yep sorry two foot so it's okay. um yeah and that's that's the thing I, I say it's a 12 foot by 28 foot layout those are maximum dimensions but you'll see like the left half of the room here that's uh about 13 feet of the 24 feet of scenic layout right so in terms mm. of length gotcha four feet of it off to the right is a dispatcher's room there's no scenery in there. And so really the main layout is contained within 24 feet and 13 of those 24 feet are only 10 feet wide. And then there's a sump pump in the corner that screws it up even more. So like there's a lot of layout that's only 10 feet in width. And then for some reason, I decided to put the widest part of the peninsula in that half of the room, um, which was, I was aware of what I was doing when I made that decision. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't regret that one actually um for a few reasons but um yeah it's it's not big there there's a, a lot of layout in there so would you consider instead of the peninsula would you go consider doing a third deck then yeah i i've well there's two things i would consider one i would do this in n scale and then in doing that <laughs> Whoa! Would, yeah, yeah wow <laughs> i know there's a lot there's a lot to it you don't just casually switch to another scale um, I oh, yes, you do. That, yeah, you Mike, do. Mike, that, well, Mike does. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I just I just meant I I uh, I have to acknowledge the challenges that come with modeling in N scale or any other scale that that I get to take for granted with HO scale. Right. Just like the ready to run nature of equipment and, and like mechanically sound equipment that just works mm -hmm. out of the box. I think yeah. there's a lot of things that I would have to do. Um, to, to get to that point in end scale but yes i've played around with this track plan before it's not going to happen right but i just wanted to think about <laughs> it in this in this space if i were to tear it all down and restart i think an open floor plan so just around the walls no peninsula uh i would include a helix and then i would find a way perhaps to do three levels but i'd have to play around with that idea because to me it's not like the the ultimate goal is not necessarily just like as much linear main line as possible um so if three decks really compromised viewing angles and accessibility and scenery i think i'd i might not go for that um but if you know if it looked good and and i could accomplish the goals i think uh helix and scale three levels in this space would be kind of cool yeah yeah that'd that be would awesome be that would so be I, really, really cool. It would, it would be, it would be very, very fun to watch. I, I have a, I have a question, um, and and if again for those in the chat this evening, if you have questions for Cam, make sure you're getting them in there. Um, the the question that I have, or it, it's a comment then a question. So it sounds like operations plays has played a very large part in not only you transitioning away from your old layout to your new one. Um, but even on your old one, operations was essentially the uh, and specific operations was the focal point. 
was when you started building the layout, was it your first rendition of the layout? Was it always operations in mind? And I apologize if we, we covered that earlier, but I'm just, my mate, my brain's going, you know, a hundred miles a minute here trying to catch up. And, and I, I'm curious as to, did you try and jam operations into, into this layout um, after you kind of built it or, or what happened here? Cause it sounds yeah. like the operations bit graded on you quite a bit. And then yep. you got to the point where it's like, that's it. We're, we're, we're tearing it up. <laughs> uh, no, nope, that, that is accurate. And, and a good question because it, it, yeah, it's all the things that you said. I think I wanted operations to be central to the layout's design and execution. Um, I was thinking about it, obviously, because I said, I want to do manned helper operations, but I didn't really define what that meant. Like I didn't mm. think about operators or, um, you know, an operating scheme, even dispatching, things like that. I just knew that my heart was set on Crawford Hill. And I think a, something that greatly limited me was operating experience. I have ah. pretty much only operated my layout. I've, I've gone to maybe two other operating sessions, really only, yeah, really two operating sessions on like an established layout that has an operating scheme. And so most everything else, I've tried to fill in the gaps. I've learned from people who have come over and either run trains with me when it was supposed to be an operating session or actually had a, a successful operating session and given me feedback. And like this, the operating aspect is a continually evolving piece of the layout, even to this day, like with, within the last few weeks, I have tweaked a lot of things in the operating scheme. I think I finally settled on something that is reliable and enjoyable um, and, and fun. But yes, I think the fact that I didn't, I wasn't able to, piece together all the elements necessary in my own head to create uh, an enjoyable, coherent operating scheme that that restricted my layout design. And then when it mm -hmm. when my knowledge grew and my experience grew and I started to get more into the operating, I realized that what I wanted out of operations didn't really fit the layout from a conceptual level. And so that's where the friction sort of developed from. And so the reset with Marias Pass was kind of uh working with a, a coherent cohesive piece of mainline that made more sense from a conceptual perspective so that then the operations could sort of like sift into place more naturally and that that has worked okay can you imagine where he's gonna be when he's 45 years old dude when he gets to my <laughs> age it's when he gets be... to be my yeah. age and your age andy i mean yeah. oh my and he's doing this now Too kind i mean no. honestly no, no, <laughs> no, dude, no, seriously. No, 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 no. Right, This I'll, is I'll take it. this is the truth. <laughs> I mean, I you are years ahead of, you are years ahead of yourself here. This is yeah. amazing. This is amazing. It is Thank you. It, it, it's just amazing to me because I can tell you something right now. When I was 25 years old, I probably changed my mind six thousand times before you know in a week as to what I was gonna do. <laughs> I couldn't I could there was no way. But now, that was you know well back in the 1990s, uh, yeah. and and it was a situation where, like you said, we didn't have the ready to run stuff. We didn't have the yep. availability. You know, the things weren't. We didn't have DCC back then. We didn't have all of the things that you have available to you. So, do you think that today's technology with locomotives dcc all these things are allowing you to help forward your operations plan because you're able to do things on a level that's closer to what the prototype is easier yeah. with without a lot of you know smoke and mirrors so to speak like we used to have to do in a day yep yeah no doubt i think th there's just so many plug and play pieces when it comes to um, DCC that you can you can tack on components at, like as like as I'm learning about operations and what I want from my layout it, it's not entirely true that you know you can just kind of piece it together as you go because I've tried to move away from that with version two of the layout and I, I 
be, I got myself focused and restarted and I said, I, this is what I want to do in terms of block detection, dispatching, all that. And so I'm going to, I'm going to build everything from the ground up um, in the right order to make that possible. Uh, but I think you're right. Like I, since I'm, I'm not, I'm just buying off the shelf products for the most part when it comes to dispatching and control, you know, switch motors, things like that. And since it is DCC, nope. I don't have to do anything crazy with like different power districts and, and, and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. I just think there's fewer roadblocks. Yeah. Um, you can, you can play around with different operating schemes and learn what you want to do because you're right. Like the, the layout just from a, a basic operating level, in other words, just moving locomotives and cars, you can run it like the prototype does. And that is independently. If you want to move this locomotive and this number of cars, yep. you, you can do that without having to like really think about it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's easier to, to sort of wade into the, the depth of operations at your own pace. Excellent. Look, Cam, let's get you back on track here, pun intended, um, and and get get rocking and rolling here with part two. And I and I, you're being a great sport about all the questions, and we do appreciate it because there's a lot of them coming in. So. Absolutely, yeah. And it, if uh, I apologize, I think I did warn everyone, but um, my words are getting the better of me and so i am missing questions but yeah if, if you oh don't drop, worry about it <laughs> don't worry i'm i'm writing them all down um okay, who's, awesome. who's sending them in we'll have a lightning round at the end here i promise you yep awesome all right so version two right i explained what was wrong with the last version and then so i i, I was going through a move and some changes and it seemed like just the wrong time to be thinking about model railroads so basically from the middle of 2021 until uh oh this is incorrect it should have said what year is it it's 2023 2023 yeah, according so, to my sundial I, I i was gone for i think hold on i didn't work on the layout for the better part of a year let's put it that way i stopped middle 2021 there's a lot going on i just like didn't do any modeling didn't really think about it at all and wasn't super excited about the layout and then towards the latter part of 2021 I started to get more excited about what was then just the lower level of the layout. And I was like, man, the Montana scenery is awesome. I'm seeing some fantastic photos. This is getting me motivated. And then I started to collect photos uh, from areas that were upgrade from what I was modeling. And I started to think about like, could those, like, what if, you know, just what if yeah. this could actually fit onto the rest of the layout? And I started to toy with the idea of ripping out Crawford Hill as, as like a scenery base. Um, and if not for my friend, John Caffarelli, who I brought up earlier, um, who models the UP cascade subdivision and HO scale, he basically pushed me over, you know, the, the edge, uh, that I was standing on and, and made me, um, switch to modeling the rest of Mariah's pass on, on the upper level. And it was an exciting enough idea and it fit well enough with the scenes that I, I wanted to incorporate there was just so many sort of serendipitous um, opportunities to model perspectives from the rest of the, the eastbound climb up the grade to Mariah summit that, uh, that, that pushed me to doing it. And so I got super organized. I, I made a list of all the things that I wanted to tackle. And I actually, I circled back. This wasn't just a matter of ripping out Crawford Hill scenically and, and moving forward. This was, going back and fixing the things that I didn't like about the old layout. And that started with track changes, um, mm. tweaking track. Like there were some areas where like I had installed turnouts poorly and there were derailment issues. So I went through and I fixed all of the issues that were bad with the previous iteration of the layout. And then I started from ground level installing uh, block detection, uh, signaling, turnout control, all that jazz. And then, then I started on the scenery and that took for me a lot of, discipline um mm. as well as money obviously which i keep bringing up and it's also something that um that i've on and off actually lived at home which has helped me save some money i guess um <laughs> and so i have been able to to pour some resources into the into the layout um so it took it took discipline to not just like launch into the scenery um as well as some some resources to get it done 
Um, but again, just to orient you, on the far western end of the layout is Whitefish. That's the yard. And then there's Columbia Falls. There's an industry area. Um, west Glacier slash Belton. There's a, there's a canyon scene. Essex is where Crawford used to be. And then basically from Essex to Mariah Summit is is the upper level that used to be Crawford Hill. And so I've got photos now laid out just basically from all those scenes and, and we can look at those. Um, but here is the logo. So early last year, um, my dad, again, enabling me, encouraging me, getting excited about this, this new project. Um, he got into it the way that I think excited him. And that was coming up with the branding uh, material for the, for the layout. And so he came up with this logo on the left, which is what we landed on. And you can see um, there's quite a bit of inspiration drawn from the old Great Northern uh, Rocky logo there, yeah. um, both in color and, and other things. Plus the modern day BNSF swoosh a little bit. Yeah, you mm -hmm. saw that. I'm glad. Yeah, I, absolutely. That's yeah. the first thing yeah. I actually picked up on. It was the first thing. Well, what's kind of cool, and I actually didn't realize this when he drew it up first, is that, so this is obviously just a stylized version, but at Mariah Summit in the background are some pretty fantastic mountain peaks um, of the Continental Divide. So that's what that's resembling here. But the swoosh itself, if you think about it, is like a train too, right? Like that's a train cresting. Oh, yeah. the, oh there you the go. Divide. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, so anyway, logos are cool. Um, they are cool. <laughs> they are very cool. <laughs> This is the uh, the layout at a glance. So we're modeling, I, I said here for era summer of 2023, just because I kind of keep up to date with um, contemporary railroading. And, and this summer, actually, because of the uh, the bridge collapse on Montana Rail Inc., they, yeah. they sent some equipment up north to the Highline subdivision. There were a lot of detoured trains and interesting movements. And I, I had actually, just because I wanted one, I bought a Montana Rail Inc. SD70 ACE. You see that in this photo here. And so it just kind of worked out that like this summer um, that happened on the prototype as well. So I've, I've listed that as, as you know, the, when I'm modeling, but really I think like next year I'll, I'm modeling 2024 and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, uh, so it's about a 200 foot main line. There's three passing sightings. Um, we use a combination of CTC dispatching. There is a CTC screen as well as a, uh, uh, some track warrant control territory where I haven't yet installed signals. Um, and so here's the prototype grade chart, just threw that in there to show you that I've, were the scenes that I'm focusing on. So if you look from left to right, um, the whole layout is contained between Whitefish and the, the top of the grade, the highest elevation there at Marias slash uh, summit here. Um, and the scenes that I'm modeling, again, from left to right, are Whitefish, oh. Columbia Falls, Belton, Essex, Blacktail, and then Summit. So there's a lot that gets skipped in there, right? So there's there's a lot of distance that is not covered, but those are the, the scenes that fit the best and that I am modeling. Um, and so here is the, the track plan in full as it currently stands. So the lower level is on the bottom, um, upper level there on the top, you can see starting at the very bottom of the grade um, is the yard at Whitefish. And then you start to head up more or less uh, like a one and a half, a little less than that uh, percent grade up to Columbia Falls. And then you'll see, if you recall the track plan from earlier at the lower level, the industries are still where the industries are, except now it's a very simplified track plan and it is prototypically based. So this track arrangement is very mm. much like the actual Columbia Falls um, track arrangement and so we have oh, a warehouser cool. facility there just like the prototype and then there is a track that kind of heads into the backdrop there and i'll show that later but that simulates the branch line that heads down to um kalispell montana and if you look at the sort of the inset here that that map that i stole from trains magazine the blue line that extends to the south there um, and heads to kalispell that's the branch line that on my layouts track plan there at Columbia Falls swings off and, and just disappears into the backdrop. So that's what that's simulating. It's functionally just a tail track to help switch the, the warehouser plant there. Um, but on the prototype up until 2020, that was a, a branch line that was operated by um, the Mission Mountain Railroad. And so we're simulating mm -hmm. that operation by uh, interchanging cars there. So cars will run from Whitefish to Columbia Falls on the the Columbia Falls local, 
and they will actually switch the warehouser facility that's handled by BNSF. But there's also cars that will be picked up and dropped off on an interchange track that are then uh, suggested to head down that branch line when the Mission Mountain Railroad comes up from the south and then takes those cars down the line. That's cool. <laughs> um, so it's really, it's only one industry, but there is simulated traffic off layout as well, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so then <laughs> you you continue up the grade uh, and then you dick up, excuse me, duck into the dispatcher's room and transition to the upper level. So then if you're looking at that upper pane, this is where everything's new, right? So the lower level is modified. I did make track plan changes, namely at Columbia Falls. The upper level, a lot is different. The main line is is not, right? So the actual like placement of the tracks did not change um, because the placement of the tracks on the original iteration of the, of the layout were not prototypically driven necessarily. It was, it mm. was base restrictions. Like this is what sure. fits in, in the room. Um, it was supposed to be double track and it wasn't so i i didn't have to change that um but what did change were the sort of extra tracks you know siding spurs and all that in what was crawford and is now labeled essex there at the top of the screen um so that all changed and then all the scenery upgrade from there all got ripped out and it, it is new hmm. um so this is uh how did you model that, that? That's good well, modeling, dude. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> got me, got me. You got the shadows yeah, this there. Looks, this looks terrible comparatively, but um, yeah. So whitefish. This is a, a Justin Franz photo who I've taken a lot of inspiration from. It's not a huge yard, which works out great, right? So the original right. yard that I was going to model, I, I said it was Northtown. Absurd. It it just you couldn't <laughs> really capture that in this space. But this yard that you see here is like you can reasonably model that in the space that i have and it's basically it just handles traffic to and from columbia falls um, we simulate a a manifest or a mixed freight that gets built out of the yard and heads up the line as well incorporating that traffic from columbia falls but for the most part it's a crew change point so you see a couple unit trains on the main line and siding here just like on the prototype it's it's a division point um, between the the kootenai river subdivision to the west and the High Line subdivision that i'm modeling and so there's often crew changes here at Whitefish. Um, here's the other end of the yard with some crew facilities, some uh, EOT devices that we throw on trains from time to time. Um, here's a question yeah, coming in real quick uh, from Matt. He's asking, Cam, are you planning to model the roundhouse? I am not. And so that's one of the, hold on. Yeah, that's over here. So that's one of the things that's, perhaps least like the prototype on my version of whitefish is that this is just sort of a generic uh, fueling facility or, or servicing facility, I should say. On the prototype, um, there's a bit more going on there and like the, the building complex isn't quite like that. Um, so this is a holdover from the old layout. I just, uh, I really liked the structure. It's already been detailed and installed and all that. So I, I kept that. Um, so yeah, not, I don't have any plans to, to model the, the roundhouse, but it would be cool to spend a bit more time focusing on the, the uh, servicing facilities at, at the prototype Whitefish, but um, I am not. Oh, sorry. So here's, um, we kind of saw this perspective earlier, but this is how it looks now. So we got the yard down below um, and then up above it, which used to be Crawford Hill, you can see is now transformed into uh, a developing version of Essex, Montana. I see someone's asking about Amtrak as well. There are um, multiple Amtrak stops on the layout technically. So on this prototype photo, you can see way in the background on the other side of the road bridge there, there's a, a station at Whitefish and there's a big long Amtrak platform. So the Empire Builder stops at Whitefish and then also stops at Essex. Um, and so I do plan to model the platforms at both of those locations. Um, they haven't been constructed oh, yet. Cool. But, That'd be um, awesome. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, I don't have an Amtrak consist either, but, um, my friend, John, who I keep bringing up, he, he does since he models, uh, um, a line that also features some long distance Amtrak equipment. So, uh, we have a, an agreement that at some point he needs <laughs> to bring it over so we can do some, some photo ops. 
pl- please no chargers. <laughs> yeah, none none so far. Only P forty two. So not a fan. No, I don't like the chargers. <laughs> I'm not a fan. They are kind of neat to watch at night, though. I mean, they are really kind of yeah, with, the, with all the light with all the lights and the back yeah. panels and stuff. But it's they don't sound that, inspiring. They are not they don't sound inspiring. No, yeah. they're not. They're or, not. Yeah. They're actually more boring than a P forty two. They really are. <laughs> What what would your Amtrak uh, equipment preference be? F forty PH dash twos. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, nope. I could get behind that. That'd be yep. cool. I'd have to go back a few decades on on my layout, but yeah, there's some some cool. Uh... Well, now there's a good question. Yeah, you could actually do this as a BN uh, layout, couldn't you? If you yeah, wanted to backdate, like straight BN, right? Yeah, I I definitely could, and. I've resisted the urge to like allow that thought to develop, but there have been a few times where I have <laughs> come across some really cool like vintage helper operations on this line. I've gone like, oh man, some like SD forty fives and SD forty dash two sitting up at S six would be so cool. But don't I, go to Alan I, Schrader's house. Yeah, don't go to Alan Schrader's, Schrader's house. house. Here. Yeah, you you will find yourself just walking I'm, out of there with green and black. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. We'll go yeah. home, and everything that's got orange on it will be gone. It'll be just the green. <laughs> It'll be it just the away. green. Yeah. yeah, I could be convinced. Um, I, I'm enjoying what I'm modeling now, but yeah, if I ever got bored enough that I just wanted to sell all my equipment and, and change some signals, I could. I could definitely do that. Hey, um, I do. Before you keep on going, I do have one thing that you brought up here earlier. You brought up Montana Rail Link, and you brought yeah. up. You brought up going into 2024. Now, I mean, it's well documented. BNSF has taken them over again. So the 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 Montana Rail Link. Are you planning on getting a little bit more MRL stuff onto the layout to help simulate some of that power transitioning back into the BNSF fleet, or or do you are you just good with where you're at with the with things right now? I. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just curious to see how it develops. In fact, the reason that I bought that MRL unit, and it's the only one I have on the layout, um, is for reasons that you're citing. And that's just my expectation that those units might start to float around a bit more. I, nope. I'm i not sure that's happening yet because it's still like they're operating, um, I believe, you know, more or less functionally as, as they had been. But I can't imagine that that'll last forever. So I was kind of getting ahead of myself and just pretending that that unit would be floating around a bit more. And then of course that happened this summer because of uh, infrastructure issues. But um, yeah, I'll just, I'm interested to see if that situation becomes a bit more fluid because it does happen from time to time or has in the past um, with, with power being sent all the way out to Spokane, right? You know, MRL out to Sandpoint, but then they'll continue through to Spokane and repay horsepower hours. And there have been a few times where trains that originate in Spokane and then head east over the Highline subdivision just hold on to those MRL units. Um, And so that's kind of what I was simulating. But I, in a way, I'd like to imagine that that'll happen more in the future, as sad as it is for Montana Railink. Um, and And I do wish that that operation would stay as it is but for my layouts purposes it'd be interesting to see if more of that power shows up so basically what you're saying is is that in the future this is going to transition into an mrl layout then eventually yeah right? <laughs> exactly yeah i love how we're just spending all of cam's all money that he has isn't that job. awesome well i don't yeah. have any money i mean it <laughs> might as well spend somebody else's mm. all right I, I am fascinated by the Montana Rail Link operations and, and I've even played around with the idea of like, well, maybe, you know, with, with the Montana Rail Link takeover, like what if, what if BNSF, you know, operations executives get inspired by, by their helper practices and all of a sudden you got like three unit helper sets or four unit helper sets and mid-train helpers and things like that. And, um, I haven't played around with that much, but it's, it's something to, to dream about. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, heading up the grade that's whitefish and then here's columbia falls as i mentioned you can kind of see uh, if you reference the satellite image down below those white structures with the silver roofs um, that's the weyerhaeuser mdf for medium density fiberboard plant kind of hard to see but there is there's a single um spur track that heads through one building and then uh skirts in front of another and then um 
you can see even the orientation of the main line is more or less accurate. So this is a, a bad photo for comparison, but that coal train is sitting on basically uh, main track two. And then in front of it is the main line. You can see how it heads down the peninsula, kind of curves off to the left on the prototype. Same thing. We're heading from right to left and sort of curves off um, towards us. And then the huge stack of lumber down there, um, you'll see there's another track that kind of follows its curvature. And that again is that line that on my layout, you can see up there that, that swings off into the backdrop and goes nowhere. On the prototype though, that that's uh, the leg that heads down to Kalispell. And again, uh, up until recently was operated by the Mission Mountain Railroad. And so those two center beam flat cars there that are loaded with uh, wrapped lumber, those are interchange cars that are um, like simulated to to have come from uh, that's cool. that's points a good down idea. Yeah. close to Kalispell. That's a good way to integrate that into things. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It it um it just again something that just seemed to work out. Like this is the correct orientation, and didn't really have to to mess around with things too much. It just kind of like fit on the peninsula. Um, and since it's a it's a huge facility, but like operationally with the single spur track, it's it's somewhat simple. And for that reason, you can fit it into this peninsula that really isn't that wide. I think this is a, a 16 inch deep scene for wow. most of it. Um, and so you can get basically a prototype version uh, of this scene without a huge degree of compression. Um, and it's, again, it is simple, but it provides a fair bit of switching. Um, so it's like, it's not just a, a five minute job. Like you actually have to think about car placement and, and all that. So it's, it's a lot of fun to operate. And so here's that facility. Obviously not done. This is one of the like least complete areas on the layout. A lot, lot to add here. Um, all right, moving along. Okay, so we head around the end of the peninsula and then this is uh, Belton. Um, so this is the canyon scene um, that, that's inspired from a, a variety of perspectives. This is sort of a mishmash of things basically between some, some interesting like scenic points between Columbia Falls and the actual location of Belton on the prototype. So I've combined a few things. Generally, you can sort of call this area uh, the beginnings of John F. Stevens Canyon. That's what it is on, on the prototype. Um, so there's some pretty cool geography or geology, not geography. I guess it is. Maps are cool too, but um, the rocks <laughs> are cooler. Um, and this, so this is the Middle Fork Flathead River yet to be poured. Um, but we do have water features on the layout. Um, this is that's a cool you know, picture. A, nice. Yeah, this is one I posted recently. Um, and this is where, like, this scene here, this whole thing is twelve inches deep, front to back. And so, when you take photos like these, like it, it looks bigger than it is. You can still see the backdrop back there, but even at this super shallow angle, um, I'm excited that that you can fit what feels like a much bigger scene into this yeah. uh, very narrow shelf. It looks like thousands of feet, <laughs> you know, I mean like yeah. scale feet, right? It looks, yeah. it looks long. Yeah. And it, it's hard to tell here, but actually if you follow those grain cars back, it goes through one tunnel there, tunnel 4.0. And then in the background, like looking through that tunnel, you can see the tunnel portal of the, the next arc. tunnel. That's tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. 8.9. Um, and so this is um, basically one half of the scene was inspired by this. You see this really cool tunnel portal with the uh, external tunnel bracing. It's like exposed for the beginning of the tunnel. Uh, that's kind of what's being modeled here, mm. but in like an inverted perspective. So those braces are on the outside there. And then also the like angular stratigraphy there of those rocks is, is kind of what's going on here. I love that. Right. Um, that so that's, awesome. that's what was inspired by. So quick stopping point here. Um, are you going to talk about how you did the rocks? Because um, one of the questions that we did get was on your exposed rock like that. How did you yeah. do that? Yeah, I, I wish I included um, some more like process photos. Uh, sure. But that's what YouTube's for. And I do have hours and hours of, of videos that I'm <laughs> working through editing. And I have like a, an 18 episode series on the transformation to this point. Ooh. And I will cover the rocks. Yeah. Well, scary thing, actually, I had, I think 
approaching a thousand separate video clips, which was like hundreds of gigabytes of video. And, and I had it all just like locally stored on my laptop and I've never killed a computer, but a few weeks ago I That'll dumped a whole 16 ounce tea into it and it didn't like that. And miraculously I was actually able to recover all the, the video. It took like multiple days because the, the hard drive was like on its last legs and, and barely worked, but I got it all off. Uh, so it's been kind of a pain to reset, but I will have all that covered. Um, but I, for rocks, I do pink insulation foam. Um, that's just carved. So these here, that's like one inch pink insulation foam um, strips that are like layered, right? Mm-hmm. At, on an angle. And then, so the main stratigraphic unit, if you will, is the one inch piece of foam. And then the actual like uh, rock mold, if you will, like the texture of the rock. I, I just used box cutters and then I would... Um, I would score the face of the pink foam probably like half an inch to three quarters of an inch deep and sort of like a couple different angles and then using a putty knife or that box cutter just kind of like roughly chunk it out yeah and yeah. miraculously just like it kind of popped out. It out and pop it, pop yeah. pieces out of it and i i kind of just like it was rewarding because you don't have to think about it i'll just go down the length of the foam and like a few will come out and you're like ah that looks kind of good let me get a couple yeah. more in a different spot and then like it just evolves and eventually it looks how you want and it doesn't take that long so so and then chris bell has a, a question about backdrops mm. you have a video about how you did the backdrops too correct yes sorry not to get ahead of ourselves i'll go back through those but um I, I will have a video on that and it's all, it's all latex paint. So yeah. um, the backdrops that you see here, it's, it's four colors. I basically created a, a mood board um, of, of some photos that I thought that's really were nice. sort of the, that's the vibe awesome. or feel I was trying to capture. And then I, I color matched those on uh, Adobe Illustrator and then just purchased those latex paints. And then um, really simple, like it's, it's four layers. Um, and then it's just brush technique to get the top edge of the, the tree line and a couple layers. Um, it's almost like overly simple. And, and that was a decision I made. Like I could have spent a lot more time trying to detail the backdrop. Uh, but I feel like in a lot of places, it's pretty effective at extending the scene. Like especially here, this is that scene of uh, Belton. Um, not so much from a shallow angle, but if you're like perpendicular to it, uh, it looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, just a, a note um, to the to the section crew. Uh, make sure that you go out and sub to Cam's channel um, on Railfan Two Twenty if you haven't, because there's going to be a lot of good tutorials coming out about some of the scenery and some of the stuff that he's doing. Please go and 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 do yourself a favor and and sub to that now. Um, so that you can see in detail the answers to some of these questions. Yes, thank you. I, I will have um, tutorials on pretty much every big topic. I, I've released three of those episodes already, and then I killed mm-hmm. my computer, and so I'm kind of reorganizing <laughs> still. Um, but there's, I think I, I plan on another 15, and those are intended to be released every Tuesday. Again, I'm off schedule, but that'll that'll start back up again. Mm. Um, yeah, more inspiration, same scene, blah, blah, blah. It's rocks, 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 trees, water, rocks, 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 trees, yeah. rocks, trees water, <laughs> tunnel. tunnel. Uh... We say that, we say that going into north of Green Bay on, on the thing. You have trees, 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 oop, town, trees, trees, trees. Yeah. That is, but that's something I wanted to capture, you know, like it, it's tempting to try to put an industry everywhere on the layout, but, um, just the layouts that I've taken the most inspiration from have some of, the, the coolest, most open, wide scenes where like yeah. it's just the main line and like you can see the better part of a long train in it. And that's so rewarding to me because when I'm out rail fanning and taking the photos that I love to take, that's that's what I want to see uh, on my layout. Um, so I try to capture that. And here's a, a couple side by side examples of like the scene inspiration um, and then execution on the layout. Obviously, some different lighting scenarios and, and um, even weather, but more or less like that's the perspective that I was trying to capture. And there's still details to come. So none of these scenes that I've 
shown even to this point what I consider done, like this one here on the bottom, the, the canyon scene, like there's a lot of uh, vegetation variety that I need to add, grass tufts, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but... So how far how far back are you doing your tunnel portals? Like like how far, how deep into the tunnel oh. do you go? I mean, you're not doing the entire yeah. sleeve, right? You're not no. doing the entire thing. How far, How deep into that do you do? Because people have... That's kind of one of those things where perspective and angles start to get play into things, right? Absolutely. Yeah, dang. I don't have any photos of it. But so this tunnel here, geez, sorry. Um, <laughs> the short one, right? So the, the short one where, you know, on the upper photo that train's about to enter, that is probably only about 12 inches long. And so I did model the whole liner for that. And, yeah. and I made sure for that one, actually both of them, that I had the full vaulted ceiling. Um, so I cut the one out of two inch uh, pink insulation foam, like you see here, just using, excuse me, like a wire cutter, um, and then just like stacked the pieces end on end until it was long enough. So that's how I did the liner um, for that one. That's actually the main tunnel structure as well. And then the other tunnel was a holdover from the old Belmont tunnel that I had modeled on the Crawford Hill version of the layout. And that I used, it's a curved tunnel liner, which is really hard to do um in my opinion to get like the full vaulted ceiling and the curvature yeah. it's it's really trippy uh but for that i just did like cardboard ribbing on the outside kind of like the external bracing that's actually modeled on um this tunnel oh, here yeah. almost like that and then yeah. on the inside i like hot glued strips of paper covered it in a ton of tape plastered it and, and that's how i got the the curvature wow. so that's um sorry that is this tunnel here on the left that one only goes back like probably 10 inches um but that it's also the actual portion of mainline that is not visible is pretty long because that's where that train is it's coming out of the um the dispatcher's room so it's in darkness oh, for probably I a good, like actual 15 feet so it's like pitch black back there so i didn't continue it very far um yeah, and so to my point, that that bottom left photo there, that is the, if that train were going the other direction, that is the last point that you see on the lower level. And then the next time you pop out, you're on the upper level. And, and this is the scene that was most heavily changed. So this was Crawford, Nebraska, and it became Essex. And so this is just sort of a, a screenshot of all the elements that I tried to capture. Um, this is the prototype Essex sort of oriented the way that it, it fits on my layout. And so there's a bit of compression going on here. Like there's a, there's a crossover that's way around the corner from the S6 that most rail fans think about. Um, I've included that in my scene and then I've also incorporated the auxiliary siding. Um, but there's other features that I didn't include like in the foreground here to the right would be a, a maintenance of way yard um, as well as the Isaac Walton Inn. But this shelf is only 16 inches deep and I didn't want to compress too much. So I decided to, to leave those features out. Is this one of those spots like you were talking about before where it starts to get to be a pinch point? Yeah, right where this photo is taken. Yep. So right to the right of where the camera is, is where the peninsula like bows out at the end of it. So yeah, yeah, definitely a pinch point. And you're right. If, if there weren't a peninsula, I may have bumped this scene out right where the camera is basically to include the Isaac Walton in and to, to include the, uh, the little yard there. But, um, just would not have worked so left it out now are you trying really hard to keep uh the layout perspective true to east west like you like it is in the prototype whereas like if the if the isaac walton in and like so say you wanted to build it it if yeah. that was that would be technically in the aisle yeah. Whereas, whereas, are there places on the layout where you actually inverted yeah. the scene in order to get a, a certain portion into the layout that you wanted or in a certain element into the layout that you wanted? Because if you didn't, it would be yep. like in the aisle. Yep. Um, I did that. So Whitefish is one of those actually where like it is very much laid out like the prototype is and it has the prototype feel with like the main line and siding being out front and then the yard behind it but right. if you're looking at the yard on the prototype from that perspective you're looking north and on my layout if you're facing the main line you're always looking railroad south 
And so it's kind of butterfly the other way. It just right. works that way better. Um, Essex here is correctly oriented. Columbia Falls that we looked at is correctly oriented. The, the canyon scene is pretty much correctly oriented. But what's really interesting is that when we get up the grade, I'm going to go back to the track plan. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, sorry, you're doing sorry. great. <laughs> you're doing fine. Um, this is, this okay. is perfect. Um, <laughs> so if we focus on the upper level here on, on the top side, one thing that happens is that when you get out of Essex, so Essex kind of includes shed 12 here, not far from shed 12, that big, long brown structure on the prototype when you head up the grade, you cross Java Creek trestle. And at that point on the prototype, you switch from basically the south side of the valley. Oh, no. Is your Sorry, my AirPods died. just died. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> better, actually. Hey, you know what? Your technology just went right in with ours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah sorry about that oh no, don't okay. be you're good but but anyway so to answer your question the whole stretch of grade basically upgrade um from shed 12 there is flipped because on the prototype you switch sides of, of the mountain valley like you're gotcha. skirting along the south edge of basically the river then you cross the river and head to the north side of the valley on the prototype but that doesn't happen on my layout because I, I could have simulated that technically, but then all of a sudden all the vertical scenery would be in the foreground and you wouldn't see the tracks. Right. So I just kind of yep. had to roll with that. Um, and so the scenes basically through black tail, the grades in the wrong direction, but visually it looks correct. Same with right. summit. Um, yeah. So good question. That's, that's sort of the, I don't know. A real prototype modeler would say like, well, this isn't a very well-designed layout then. And it's like, well, obviously I kind of laid the framework for that. Um, but <laughs> it, it, I'm, the goal really for me was like capturing the, the feel um, both operationally and visually and um, just trying to like capture a, a sense of, of place that, that I've been to, you know? And yeah, you know, right. Been. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, to, to tie in one of our, our guests that we've had on the show, Boomer uh, Dioramas, you know, he talks about immersion and, and really bringing you into a scene and, and, and you know, transporting you there. Your layout from, from the areas that you've got covered this evening does that. And a hardliner prototyper would be hard-pressed to – you know, come back to you, Cam, and say, "Wow, it's not going the right way." This, that, and the other. I mean, you walk into, you're going to walk in and, and just get drawn right in. Yeah. And I think, I think you know, you've really captured the essence of, of this line. Appreciate it's really it. Really great. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I that is really just been the the primary goal for me is is the look, um, and and also maintaining sort of like a consistent style so that like each scene continues from the last even if it's not connected right this scene at essex i'm using the same methods as at belton so like even though that train ducked through the tunnel and went through the dispatcher's room when you pop back out it it doesn't feel like like where am i which was an issue with the old layout and and so that's been a a nice change for me um i have just prototype references kind of showing the perspective this yeah. photo is taken from a pedestrian bridge on the prototype and in the foreground of this layout photo you can see the foundation for what will be the ramp up to that pedestrian bridge it hasn't been built yet but <laughs> some more prototype features we looked at the the backdrop and then I, I did talk about operations a little bit we do use helpers on the upper level and this mm. is something that worked out super well and was one of the selling points to myself when i considered making this switch that's on the original layout this scene here was crawford nebraska crawford is a manned helper base on that line and it made the most sense just from the physical layout to make this scene Essex when I decided to switch to modeling the rest of Mariah's Pass. And it just so happens that Essex is the midpoint of the grade, basically, of Mariah's Pass. It's also the midpoint of the grade on my layout. And it was already a helper base. And once again, it's a helper base. So it's kind of funny that that operationally has remained similar, um, despite the fact that I moved the upper level multiple states over. 
I like how you say that so casually. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, <clears throat> it, is, it is what happened more or less. Um, yeah. So here's here's that ramp up to what will be the pedestrian bridge nice. at Essex, and there's sort of oh, a, yeah. a photo oh, of it. Cool. It, it looks like you captured that. That's great. Um, and he, so here's a, a, just a comparison. This is Crawford oh. on the left, what it was, sort of similar perspective, and, and here's Essex now. So same scene, oh, same, nice. shelf, same bench work, walls, all that, but but the scenery and tracks have changed a little bit. That's really cool. Um, all right, just thumbing through them now, trying to think of. So we're, we're working up the grade now. We start to hit the grade here. This is the the end of Essex. This is what will be shed twelve. So we'll look at the the first shed I have completed, but you can imagine a snow shed covering this section as well. Um, and, and here we are. So this is Blacktail, basically the perspective that we saw at the beginning of these slides. Um, grain train coming out of the, the snow shed there. And this is where I've started to add some, some small details. So um, one thing that I feel like, I, I wouldn't say I've been criticized over, but like as I've been sharing these photos, I think people almost get the sense that like I'm trying to tell everyone, look, I'm done. Look at this awesome scene that's complete. I think it looks cool, right? But like, it's not done. There's a lot to add to it. And so I think even you would agree looking at this, that it all, it looks like a little manicured, a little simplistic, like there's one shade of grass and really only one texture. Um, and there's one basically tree type and, and basically the same size. And so while I am adding some of these more final details, like speed limit signs and things like that, there's a lot that I want to come back through with sort of a sweeping brush and touch up. But for me, like to maintain the biggest struggle for me in the past has been like getting organized in my own head about how to tackle the scenery. And so I found myself on version one of the layout, you know, focusing on like a very small section of say Crawford and then being happy with like, nice, I rendered the dirt here nicely. But then when <laughs> I went to go model up the grade, I like, mix the dirt again and it's like diff it's different than it was before and it was just i i felt like with this layout in order to be happy with the product i wanted to do things in uh in a very like broad approach and a disciplined approach and so for the most part um i did go through and i tried to do most of the dirt along the scenic section all at once and then most of the ballast uh all at once not like not a huge push all in like one day, but just like focus on the ballast, make sure the ballast looks good, then move on to grass and trees and things like that. And so the big elements for me to get the, the scene to where it is at this point, that was dirt, grass, trees, ballast. Um, and so with those things checked off the list and obviously the backdrop too, now I'm starting to add structures and details, but there's more texture, more layers to add yet um and even just today actually this scene here i started to add some some uh, vegetation texture um and he here's just mm -hmm. a photo illustrating that right like there's a lot more going on here there's little rocks on the roof of the snow shed there's there's little tufts of, of darker green breaking up the the light green grass and that sort of stuff um oh and here's how the scene used to look by the way <laughs> it's just wow. a transformation isn't yeah. it crazy that's very, nuts. Um, yeah, so that's that's the change. And then this is this is one of the better examples of like a perspective, right? So like I'm not modeling that exact snow shed. I'm modeling what's labeled as snow shed five on my layout. And this one here is I'm forgetting now. It's either shed eight or it might actually be shed five. Doesn't matter. The point is I, I took uh, inspiration from a variety of photos to build the shed on my layout. But yeah. what was important yep. to me is that this perspective of this prototype photo um, was what I sort of used as like the 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 guide um, or or like the the litmus yeah. test for what looks good. And so the details that are included in the scene, like the signage and eventually the the slide fence there off to the left, it, that's all the stuff that I want to include. And it's cool to me to be able to look at. Um, a perspective on my layout and then see that in a prototype photo, even if it's not like 100% accurate to the, to the scale inch. No, it's, you, you've captured the essence there from, you know, the S curve back to the snow shed 
the signals guarding it. I mean, it's yeah. holy cow. Big, big elements are there, right? Um, yeah. So there's the shed kind of in a full perspective. Oh, it didn't update. I did. I threw in a photo on this presentation, I thought, and it, it just kind of showing the uh, I did add some grass tough texture just uh, just this afternoon, actually. And like it already makes the scene look better. And I just wanted to bring that up to point out that like the, the scene scenery is always um, evolving. Well, the layout as a whole is a is an evolving beast on its own, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, you don't just sit at one spot and do one thing, and you're always kind of migrating from spot to spot throughout the layout, right? Yeah. Well, just the number of times that like I've reinvented what I thought the the game plan was, right, to tackle the layout. I have this long list and like these broad phases, like here's what I want to accomplish first, and then this thing, and then all it takes is just like boredom i guess uh, of that and then you you tell yourself like that and that doesn't make any sense let's let's focus on like one foot at a time and move on to the next and then you think you're going to do that and then you say no that's dumb let's go back to what i was doing and what it really for me what it is i just need to take like a break every once in a while i'm an exceptionally obsessive person and i will spend all my time as i said like doing the ballast or doing the dirt and i just like my skin's itching because I want to start making trees or whatever. And if I just step away from it from like for a day or two, then I can continue on with what the plan was, which was a sound. It was a good plan. Um, and so just sticking to the game plan that I drew out from the beginning uh, and being disciplined about that um, is a challenge, but has, has well, made this project. Welcome to the 12 step program for model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Cam. Hi, Cam. <laughs> Hi, guys. Yeah. I have an issue. Yeah, yeah my name's Cam. Hi. Um, You've really yeah. captured a lot of really well, like, like that scene right there. And yeah. like you said, it's not done yet, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, but... You can see the direction in the scene as to what you're trying to accomplish between the full, like that one right there. That's disgusting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, honestly, I mean, disgustingly good. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. you got that. You could see, you could physically see the train cresting that 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 grade right there on your layout, and it it's just this is it, one of the cool that is so cool. That yeah, is such, you, you. such a cool perspective, but you can see that the the time, the care that the the actual the obsessiveness you can see the obsessiveness <laughs> well, look at it's all right the, look at the color of the dirt and the gravel yeah that's the, what i'm talking know, the about red shade you know like to get that tint into it that's you, yeah it's there's, there's that, probably not a commercial product out there for that that's probably a lot of work that went into that yeah th this is actually an interesting scene here just you know to, to that point this is one of the few scenes that had scenery from Crawford Hill that I decided to work with instead of like ripping out. So that yeah. dirt there, it it's all been changed, but I I tinted it, like you said. So it, it was a brighter shade of sort of like Crawford sandy dirt. And I thought that what might be a better use of my time or an interesting um, sort of project is to basically add washes to it a la boomer um, and try to change the depth and, and the shade of the dirt rather than just like go over it completely. So I did sift yeah. some new dirt onto it, but then I also went in with basically like a, a satin acrylic wash where I mixed in some, some reds and Browns to kind of darken it. Um, right. And what was really cool is that the, the acrylic sort of settled out and pooled into certain areas and created almost like a damp, um, damp, wet dirt effect in a few areas like natural puddles basically yeah um which yeah. is super cool and then yeah i showed this just because like uh again like from this perspective if you step back on the prototype the further you are from the tracks right the backdrop gets more and more impressive right as you zoom in on the focal point then the background kind of moves forward as well and you get that sense of scale because this this level, or sorry, this track here uh, where the coal train is, is at 66 inches 
um, above the ground, which is like just about eye level for me. And I'm a tall person, so I'm six foot two. So it's not eye level for a I lot of people. Get but a because stool. I, yeah, I'm five ten. I have to jump, up, <laughs> jump up and down. Yeah, just we to we see got that. stools. I, I often misplace them. There have been a few times where like I've had <laughs> the grandparents over or whatever, and they're like, they want to look up there and I can't find the stool. So they don't get to see it. Um, but because it's a narrow aisle and, and because it's eye level, I wanted to model this, this perspective from some sort of a, a closer vantage point. And so the backdrop I think instinct would have told me to like make it much more grandiose and tall. Um, but because it's way up there and at eye level and you're close to the tracks and it's a narrow scene, I'm trying to like force some perspective and, and do some compression. So those trees on the prototype, they're not actually 15 feet tall, right? Or like mm -hmm. scale 15 feet tall. Yeah. They're like 30, 40, they're, they're normal sized trees on mine. I'm not modeling that modeling them that size because of this, this narrow 12 inch scene depth. And so this is more like the perspective that I'm trying to capture. All of a sudden the continental divide, the, the huge Rocky mountains in the background don't look so impressive. They're only like, you know, twice as tall as, as the train. And so just having the trees sneak over the top of the train on my layout is kind of what I'm trying to capture um, with that perspective. That's very clever. That is you smart. Didn't incorporate That's that. beyond smart. That is yeah, very thanks. clever. That's a Thank that you, is guys. that is a textbook way, in my opinion, to do horse perspective in, in that type of capacity. I well done. Thank you. Nailed it. Yeah, so, I um yeah, just I don't know. I, I think that's another thing that I could, just from like observing um the, the Southern Alberta rail layout, which I brought up now like three times. I, I'm not a mm. stalker, I promise, but I just, I love okay to admit it. <laughs> He's cool Everyone with it. it right? Yeah. Um, you know, his, his trees for the most part are like relatively small. And I think that somehow conveys a sense of space, right? It's not that they're the wrong size. Like I, I know from prototype photos that like it looks very accurate, but at the same time, like someone very easily could have modeled much taller trees and could have argued that like, oh, that's more accurate or, or that, that that's proper. Um, but in a lot of his scenes, I think it creates a sense of distance, of space, of scale. And this one is an extreme example because um, I'm only, you know, you can see how narrow it is. And I thought that would be a, a great application right. of that, that yeah. tree size. Um, but anyway, I feel like we're, I'm, I'm dragging on. So there, I do have some. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> yeah, keep it rolling, man. Keep going, keep man. Well, yeah, if we got the time, I, the, I just we wanted do. to go <clears throat> over sort of you know, um, high points of operations. This is something that we talked about earlier that wasn't really incorporated into the layout very well the first time around. Um, and now that it's a much more self-contained layout, um, thanks for stopping by Sparky and, and the kind words. Um, I think the operations make a lot more sense too. And, and what's really cool is I've gotten a lot of, um, a lot of input and a lot of engagement since coming back to the the social channels on Facebook and and YouTube and elsewhere from people who are very knowledgeable about this line. And I think mm -hmm. since I've been more focused on this line, I feel like people have come out of the woodwork to kind of give me tips and, and ideas about the operation. So I've got people who are, you know, actually working at Whitefish this summer telling me about like uh, what some of the lesser known train symbols are and the schedules and all that. And so I learned just recently that like what used to be two separate jobs or what I thought were two separate jobs are really one or can be handled by one operator. Hmm. The, the local that runs to Columbia Falls, that happens in the morning and then it turns into the switch job at the yard in the afternoon and it only runs on like certain days. So I used to have two operators doing that at the same time. Um, but again, because of space constraints, I was always eager to kind of reduce that into a single job, um, but was hesitant to because I felt like that wouldn't be proper. Um, but it turns out like that's actually how the, the prototype works. So it just works out that that has really become a single job and kind of lends itself to say we have four operators plus a dispatcher. We can have three road freights moving or two road mm. freights and, and the helper extra. And then also the switching's happening. And like, so all this is happening 
all at the same time with very few operators. And I think this layout does a decent job of simulating the movement of, of mainline traffic and also um, local car traffic too. So how many guys typically is it? About three, four? Yeah, I've had um, really probably only like three real operating sessions, I'd say, if I'm remembering correctly. And I think we've had either four um, or five. And I'm including the dispatcher there, if I'm thinking correctly. But yeah, I think generally, like the goal, the goal is, I'll just put it that way, to have four train crews. So um, it's basically like a, a switch crew. So that's going to be the local and, and yard job. And then you're going to have um, three road crews. The helpers aren't used on every road freight. So you kind of have a floater. So it's like a the helpers get called on an as needed basis. So um, and because it's not a super long main line, there's only so many passing opportunities. There is a fair bit of sitting around like the real railroads. So if you have three road freights, um, <laughs> you could have a train parked in a siding for a while. And yeah. also whitefish like the prototype is sort of a pinch point. Um, so managing traffic into and out of whitefish uh, is, is a critical aspect of the layout running smoothly. So oftentimes you'll have trains waiting at Essex, the scene you see here to get into whitefish. Um, and so I, I bring that up just to say that like you will have, if you have three road crews, you often will have that third crew available. And so when either, uh, coal or the mixed freight runs, those require helpers. And that's when the helper crew will get called to, to help them up, um, from Essex. Um, yeah, yeah. And so here's just like a, a very simple schematic of the layout. We've looked at the track plan, but this is basically, um, how you think mm. about it. If you're the dispatcher, so you got, um, it's oriented the way you look at it though. So East is to the left. And so you have the top of the grade to the left, the bottom of the grade to the right. And it's just a, a reverse loop on each end. And that's how we get trains turned around. So from whitefish on the right or the bottom of the layout, most we have it set up so that almost all road freights will depart whitefish um, heading eastbound or from right to left and then um, they'll go through the loop at the top of the grade at marias then come back down and then at columbia falls this is where the lower level reverse loop uh, swings off and it comes around to the west end of whitefish so trains heading down the grade through blacktail essex belton and then columbia falls usually if uh the dispatchers doing their job will have them swing off at Columbia Falls and use what's labeled as main track two. That way, the road freight basically ends its journey at Whitefish and it's recycled facing east and it's ready to depart eastbound um, for the next cycle. That's cool. That makes sense. That's a good idea. So That's you don't really have a good. whole lot of separation of your mainline freights then. It's, it's right. No. You don't have a whole lot of setting out or picking up at like whitefish or or, no. or or columbia falls or anything like that just the locals right pretty much yeah i've incorporated it before um and i do i do try to incorporate like unique scenarios and stuff like that but no the the road freights generally don't have like um yeah they don't set out or pick up unless it's like a bad order car and, and i do try to simulate that from time to time i have some like uh scenario cards um, and sometimes you do just have a car that's like acting up and you have to set it out. Um, so there are like unique movements that have to be made for the road freights. But for the most part, uh, I try to inject intrigue and interest into that journey, which otherwise is just yeah. a loop to loop run. So it sounds boring. Um, but I try to inject the intrigue through um, basically distributed power operations um, train handling. So I like weight the, the coal train, for example, is weighted. I program the locomotive so that there's very little load compensation. So like going up the grade is a very different experience from coming down the grade. Oh, really? Yeah. That's sweet. That's yeah. awesome. Um, where is she? So yeah, this coal train here, I won't go into the full story cause it, this is, it's actually uh, an ongoing story on my layout. I explained how like the whole coal train conundrum yeah. blew up the first version of the layout this is a consist that I had from the old layout. It doesn't make a ton of sense to have a coal train over the Highline sub. It doesn't happen that often. Um, but again, because of traffic disruptions, it does happen from time to time. And so this coal train here is modeled after a consist that you would typically see heading over the Montana rail link. And it's funny, I've been posting photos of this train and 
like regularly people are telling me that I have the wrong power on it because they're freaked out that I have like DC traction locomotives on the head end of a coal train, which is very uncommon usually for like a lot of coal trains that you'd see in like the Eastern half of the U S but for the Montana and Northwest divisions of BNSF, most often you're going to have a mixture or an entire consist of DC traction or, or C4 traction, uh, BNSF power. And so I don't have a great photo of it here, I guess. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. But this, this train is modeled after one of those. And so I'm, because it's a detoured train that usually would head over the Montana rail link, I actually run it loaded in both directions. And it's basically a weird detour in both directions. If you look at the train symbol, like it's not a regular train. Um, and because it's loaded all the time, even though it has removable loads, I put four and a half ounces of weight in each of the cars. <laughs> cars to start weigh four and a half ounces. So it's like really, really heavy. Um, it's only got 26 cars, but I have four locomotives on it, um, which are like really capable and, and pretty heavy locomotives. And it takes all of them just to get up the lower level um, oh to have and helpers to the top of the grade. And so on top of that, all the locomotives on my layout, I basically have turned off load compensation with the goal being that train handling uh, is something that you feel and have to deal with going up the grade and down the grade. So this train, like where it is right now, it's not on an exceptionally steep part of the layout. This is probably like one and a half percent, which on the prototype would be a fair bit, but with shortened train lengths and, and tighter curves and all that, yeah, it, it all kind of scales. Yeah. Um, and so this train to maintain the posted track speed here, which if I recall is 35 miles per hour, you have to have it even on this section of track at probably like 60 or 70% throttle. Coming down the grade, though, you'd be flying through at like 20% throttle. So like it, it's kind of fun that you really have to modulate um, the power depending on which direction you are, where you are on the grade. And so like this spacious God. lineage that I have here. I've That's used power, crazy. This will sort of inform the operator like what's going on on the main line. And that way you're kind of thinking about like, what's the DPU on the rear end doing versus the head end. And you're kind of thinking about coupler slack and making sure you're not string lining cars and things like that. So um, basically trying to make what would otherwise be a simple point to point run as stressful as possible. So that like a road <laughs> rate is fun, right? That's what yeah, I'm right. the layout. That's, that's well, amazing. Having run cold trains on basically level ground myself, I tell you what, it can be fun when it starts to pucker. How's that song? <laughs> it, I mean, and things, yeah. I mean, you, then you know, if you start getting your blood flowing, you know, things are, uh, and that's on level ground. I mean, I, that's, I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's those coal trains can be no joke. I mean, that's, yeah, they, they, they have a mind of their own, you know? Well, and that's probably the reason that, that they wouldn't run loads, uh, up the grade here, but, but they do, I, I have seen photos of, of loads coming down the grade. Um, it's interesting. Just recently I was made aware of the fact that eastbound loads happen from time to time. And the way I was justifying it on my layout was basically a traffic disruption over, um, you know, main lines in Alberta. There's, uh, some coal loadouts near like Sparwood, British Columbia and coal heads East, basically north of the Highline subdivision over the continental divide there. But if there were some sort of traffic disruption, they might drop into the US and like theoretically could be interchanged with BNSF at Sandpoint. It wouldn't happen. Um, but what, what is interesting and what has happened is like late last year, there were um, there was a strike at the uh, Roberts Bank coal dock out in British Columbia, where a lot of the export coal yep. that heads over the Montana rail link is heading. And so there's not really anywhere for that coal to go and it gets sold off to other buyers. And so there were a number of coal trains that headed east over the Montana rail link. And so if that sort of thing happened, but while the, you know, the bridge collapsed this summer, it, it is feasible that they would, they would send those trains over the, the Highline subdivision on my layout. And so, um, yeah. I guess I guess it could happen. Um, yeah. So this is. So what do we have on screen here? This looks like, like a board game we got going on. I know it is. It's um, 
it is almost like a board game. These were some scenario cards that I printed out just to spice up operations. Um, so aside, when aside you're, from the, the overweighted cars. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the <laughs> Let's nine get spicy. cars. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. Yeah, so you're looking on the left at like basically where you would pick up your train for the eastbound journey at Whitefish. Like you've just been called to say the coal train that you see there in the picture. And so I've got these cards basically to randomize a, a certain different, uh, a certain number of, of variables. And so on the left is like fuel levels. And so you'll, you'll pull these out. Most of the time there's no problem, but um, you might pull out like the card on the bottom that basically tells you, and the numbers don't really mean anything um, necessarily. It's, it's just like you're good or you're not good. Um, so I didn't really think about the numbers that much, but uh, it basically it is possible that you would not have enough fuel to like make it all the way. So we simulate like a, a mainline refuel at Columbia Falls or up at Essex. And it basically just adds a, a bit of delay and, and makes awesome. that difficult. For That's the a business. great idea. Well done. Yeah, thank you. And That's such a good idea. I, I stole these cards, by the way, and the idea for them from uh, MacRail, who makes fantastic products, um, PTC yeah. equipment, some some yep. different uh, add-ons, trackside stuff. So they had some cards. I think they had the defect detector template that I have on the right. So I took their information straight. Uh, directly, you know, for these cards. And, and these are kind of fun too, because there is a simulated defect detector at Belton between the two tunnels. And so as you're heading up the grade there, you are instructed as the operator to grab one of those cards. And there's a few different scenarios. You could have train too slow, you could have dragging equipment, and then the cards tell you uh, it, different instructions based on what's happening. Um, and so the train too slow one is kind of fun because you might have a train like, like the empty grain that heads eastbound um does not need helpers empty oil same thing these are empty unit trains and so just like on the prototype they don't need helpers to get up the grade but the train too slow card basically says that you've got a traction motor failing on the trailing unit so you get up to s6 you got to set it out now all of a sudden you do need helpers and so the helper crew gets called sent up to s6 and then they help that train up so it's, it's just like an extra um helper cycle yeah uh and, and it's kind of fun and then just to talk about helpers specifically, helper link is used on the prototype. And so I've seen different ways of doing this on the model. So like John Parker, he actually uh, files off or snips off half of the, the knuckle on the coupler. So it can never actually mm -hmm. really couple. Um, mm -hmm. I only have so many of these F type couplers and didn't want to do that. And wasn't even sure like which locomotives I want to have as helpers all the time and don't want to change the couplers every time I switch the locomotive. So I just shoved some, uh, for now, I don't know if this is a permanent solution, but it is fun and it works. I put some heat shrink tubing basically in, in the coupler and now it just, it just pushes rather than, um, couples. Simple. Yeah. So, and I also actually have the helper link details. I have yet to install them, but, um, that'd be something cool to, to get on there soon. And so the sequence is basically like a coal train rolls up to S6 here. The helpers are off to the right in that, pocket and so they'll they'll latch on the rear end um start to push you know and you can see the grade there a lot right this is yeah, up wow. your black. that's so pretty substantial yeah this is where the helpers are really needed um and then up at up at the summit you can see the crest in the grade and then they'll cut off on the fly and then uh, helpers drift back down and then this coal train we see the rear end of it here just to the right of it, there's kind of a, a cutout in the backdrop, and that's where the reverse loop comes back through. So the mm. DPU will disappear into the dispatcher's room, and then shortly thereafter, the head end comes back out, and then that train, it, it's its just a balloon track. Um, and so yeah. it's a little weird. You know, there's no staging on my layout, but because the mainline operations are designed to be kind of fast-paced, it, it makes it sort of a puzzle for the dispatcher um, and <laughs> forget about the fact that there's there's no staging. It just keeps keeps moving. So you're using DPU and as well as manned helpers at the same time. Is, is that a prototype practice out there? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, wow. I'd say, well, I got to think about it. It most certainly is like, like when I was modeling Crawford Hill, that's, that's an always kind of scenario. Like the coal trains are always two by one or two by two. And then also yep. a set of two manned helpers. 
And then um, Montana Railink, right? Same thing, always DPUs. For the Highline subdivision, a lot of the times the trains that are receiving help, I'd say almost all the time, um, are going to be big, heavy eastbound mixed freights that have a lot of lumber products on them. Yep. And it is the case sometimes that those won't have rear DPUs. Um, but I think a lot of the times they do uh, when they get helpers. Could be wrong about that. Um, and then the other train that, that often gets it too are like super long and heavy uh, double stacks. And those often have DPUs as well. That's cool. Hey, yeah. Mike. Hey. Dumb, dumb question. Sorry, Cam, for the interruption. But what about Byron Hill here in Wisconsin? Byron Hill, Byron Hill out of Fond du Lac is a manned helper district. And yeah. man, I spent a lot of time you know, that what's that? I spent a lot of time rail fanning that line actually. Really? Yeah. 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 Really? Um, like back on the WSC days or no, back, I mean no. within you know yeah. the last five years. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you're like 10 miles away from my house. Yeah. Oh, really? What about that? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, that's, that's super fun because you can just chase them all day, right? You're yeah, right. Road G. I'm or trying to, it is. like they're all lettered. Yep. I'm trying to think. I know. I know now they have a lot of times they've got DPUs on the hind end, but they do have a helper job that goes and it comes out of Fond du Lac. They, yep, and it's usually well, like the last set of power I heard about that was on that helper job was like the the a uh, set of. Bessemer Lake Erie's the SD forty T dash to the tunnel motors. Tunnel motors that was, yeah, yeah, that was the, that was the helper power for a while. I don't know what they have for helper power now. When I was usually, there, it was a ahead, couple of Illinois Central SD forty dash twos. That's what yeah. I was going to say. It's usually yeah. some SD forty dash twos or something, but that's a man thing. Um, and I know that they had like some cutoff stuff were on there. I believe were you know they just cut off and yeah. kept things going but it's um i'm not sure if they do it with the dpu trains or not that's kind of i got so many people i could ask i just make it heck i could probably just send a text and find out right yeah, now send a text and find out let's see what we find out yeah 10 30 right, let's get 10 30 at night let's get cam <laughs> back on track here yeah no that, I, that's interesting i i'd be curious about that too <laughs> um i'm trying to remember like there's so many things i remember about that line and rail fanning it but I, I don't recall yeah if there were any dpu trains that also had helpers um nonetheless i someone was asking about the dispatcher panel so i am using um jmri and and cats so cats is sort of like the the system that allows me to present the dispatching logic as I am here. Um, so the, it's kind of hard to tell, but this, the, some of the signals are white and some of them are gray. The white signals are actually on the layout. So the, the sightings at S6 and Blacktail are actual signaled sightings. And so we use CTC rules for basically that island yeah. and then beyond Blacktail up to Marias and then down the grade um, what's uh, west of Essex that's all track warrant control territory, basically. Hmm. Um, and so we use a combination of, of CTC rules and track warrants. So there's like a typical track warrant that we use on the layout. Usually it's pretty simple. We're not using a lot of those boxes, just like a box two and box three to get you from one point to another. Right. Um, and then, yeah, I also, someone was asking about radio. So yeah, we use, um, we do use walkie talkies. It's not a huge room, but like, the dispatcher, this is a cool thing that I haven't brought up till now, but the last couple of times the dispatcher has sat in the dispatcher's room, which is like kind of within earshot of the operators, but the walkie talkies are still necessary. But I have um, before had my friends either, uh, I've mentioned them before, Matt Forkham and John Caffarelli, they have each on separate occasion dispatched for me. And so this layout is in Indianapolis, um, but those guys live in Illinois uh, and Oregon respectively. And so I, I'm able to mirror my dispatching screen and have them remotely dispatch trains, um, and use basically like a radio, uh, walkie talkie app on our, our phone to dispatch. And that's a lot of fun to actually have someone like States away controlling the, that's route. awesome. Yeah. yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. Cause that was something that Matt had asked about earlier 
And I knew we were going to get to the operations bit about remote dispatching. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's fun. I, uh, the one thing I'd want to add to that, and I, I, it's so dumb cause I shouldn't spend the money on this, but like to me, the there's, <laughs> <laughs> that's such an absurd statement actually I'm realizing as on this podcast about yeah. um, wasting money, but, uh, <laughs> that I find there's like an aesthetic around radio communications, like the actual radio static yeah. you can use. Um, I think it's Zello is like the phone app that most often is used. Basically it's like a walkie talkie push to talk sort of app, but you don't get that like the radio handheld radio noise. Um, and so there, I know you can do like a, a cross link sort of setup between like internet or Wi-Fi radio to an actual like analog two-way radio. And so if I were to continue to do remote dispatching in the future, I think that's sort of a system that I would invest in so that I can use any of the like handheld um, radios that I use on the layout in conjunction with the uh, the remote dispatching. Because if I don't do that, then I have to basically have everyone have the same uh, phone app. To right. Do that. Yeah. Talk about a ne next level immersion. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's cool. That would be super fun. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting to the closing points here. This is the last bit of operations because I think some people I, I saw were curious about car forwarding and like how I manage traffic on the layout. Uh, yes, yeah. And I've played around with JMRI, but as I've described, it's, it's actually very simple, right? The focus on my layout is moving uh, road freights and helper operations. And that, but that doesn't mean we neglect the, the operations at Columbia Falls or Whitefish. Um, I find it still a very like rewarding and fun job. Um, but I use a very simple and flexible system so that session to session, I can just like tweak a few things and then have a, a brand new unique session. Um, could Jam or I do that for me? Yes. And I have played around with it and I have, uh, you know, created switch lists and, and manifests from Jam or I before for some reason, like I haven't gotten as into it, um, perhaps because of the simplicity of my system on my layout but conceptually what's really going on is there are a pool of cars on my layout that could possibly go to columbia falls so there's only certain car commodities and car types that would be switched at the warehouser plant here so that's going to be high cube 50 foot or 60 foot box cars and then the interchange track with the mission mountain railroad might receive uh center beam flat cars either empty or loaded or also um, some gondolas. And so the sheet, this, the delivery schedule on the left, if you look sort of towards the center, you can see that carpool highlighted where in green, you have all the cars that could possibly be delivered to or picked up from the warehouser plant. And then at the bottom, you have all of the cars which could possibly be interchanged with the Mission Mountain Railroad. Um, and so we've got the, the few different commodities there. Um, so there's a, there's a letter code indicating what what type of car it is um and then if you look to the above that to the delivery schedule if we're you know having the first operating session um of the month or whatever i would probably start with with the monday schedule and so there's a monday delivery schedule and then as we'll see there's also a monday um manifest and there will be a monday local switch list as well and so on monday it, it the warehouser plant um, has requested delivery of three high queue box cars. And so those three cars could be pulled from any of, of the pool below that's highlighted in green. And then the Mission Mountain Railroad will interchange two loaded center beams. So th those are the cars that will be assembled at Whitefish. Um, so, th so the switch job will start at Whitefish. They'll pull those cars uh, from the available pool to satisfy the needs of the industries and interchange at Columbia Falls and they'll build their train. So it'll be a five car local for Monday heading to Columbia Falls. And then at Columbia Falls, spots one and two will be picked up. And then all the cars that are already there from the last session at um, the interchange track will get picked up. So mm -hmm. assuming we made it through to the Friday session, it's probably going to be probably going to be those four cars, right? We had two box cars, a gondola and an empty um, center beam from the Friday set outs. And so they'll return with four cars. So that's sort of the concept and it's very simple. Um, but there's enough cars in play, um, and enough variety with the weekly schedule that like you can run through the session and it'll, 
it'll take a long time to cycle through the different variants. And it's like, it's unlikely that you'll ever have the same, um, the same job, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, it's very rudimentary. Um, but to me, it, it's fun. And then the switch list, as I was mentioning, this will get built based on the delivery schedule. So the, the, the crew that'll start at whitefish yard is really the local crew and they'll put, um, they'll write down, you know, the five cars that it need to get set out uh, at Columbia Falls. And then when they show up there, they will, you know, cross those off and then uh, write down the pickups as well. And then those cars come back to Whitefish. And this is the, the more interesting part to me. So that, that switch job at Columbia Falls then becomes the yard crew um, at Whitefish. And so there is a predetermined manifest uh, for the mixed freight that is to be built and it's blocked as well. So we've got car blocks. We've got block one, two, three, and four, um, as you can see with the, the gray and white banding. And then there are reserved car spots as well. So you see the blocks labeled CF for Columbia Falls. So any of those pickups like that Monday job, um, we're picking up probably it looks like box cars and then maybe like an empty gondola or something or empty center beam. Those cars will get added to the head end of this manifest unless there's an empty center beam. And then those center beams go between blocks two and three, just though so we don't like streamline cars. We don't want to put those empty beams at the front of the train. Right. Um, and yeah, so that's basically it. So the, the yard crew will assemble this manifest in block order, but the car order within the blocks doesn't really matter. Um, and then tack on, this is the Monday manifest. So it'll tack on the pickups from the Monday, uh, local that went to Columbia falls in the morning, making sure that empty center beams are sort of in the middle of the train. Um, and like that, that's the, that's one cycle and that'd be Monday. And then if there's time for more, we move on to Tuesday and so on and so forth. Hey, I have an answer. Okay. It says it all depends. Uh, this is our, from our friend. It, it, it this is our from our friend Justin. Uh, oh, yeah. He says, "Yeah, it, it all depends. Most of the time, the DP trains should make it, but there are times they get shoved or pulled. I know a few times I've heard head end of uh, heard of head end helpers on the CN. Most DPs are in the middle, about two thirds of the way back, so they just get shoved on the rear if need be. Yeah, because I've heard." on the radio some northbound trains stalling out on yeah Hill. and that's that's like right around Teresa, like right around Teresa and stuff right where they yeah. got to get pulled where they got to go get them and come pull yeah. them up the hill a little north of Teresa, Teresa. but that's interesting so um yeah so that justin hendrickson yeah yeah our good our friend justin hendrickson yeah, yeah. okay yeah. cool so and that could be and there's there's all sorts of different variables obviously that could happen with that but i mean i know the cn does usually put their helpers around in the middle of the train so yeah hmm. interesting yeah yeah so that's so is this this is pretty much your operations in a nutshell then uh cam because this looks like are you just using like excel to build these out yeah, yes, yeah, so these are just forms that I, I made. Um, and so I, I basically have a template, a separate Excel template with like my car list. And I basically yeah. am JMRI. I just like manually randomize things. Um, and right. every once in a while we'll like mix up the, the manifest. But the thing is my operations are fresh enough at this point. Where like, I've never run through all five iterations. Uh, yeah. of, like I've, I've built out five of these manifests, but like, a complete operating session or, or cycle, if you will, would be a day and a single day at Whitefish would be the morning local and then the building the mixed freight and yeah. that would complete the cycle. Um, and yeah, so I haven't yet exhausted all of them. And, and, and so to this point, this has worked and it's been fun. That's outstanding. That's really awesome. Yeah. So a couple questions came back from uh, the operations aspect. I think it was Chris Bell said, what's your favorite job to run? Oh, good question. Um, 
I think for me, it's, it's the coal train just cause like it, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, the train handling is a lot of fun. Um, and then it also requires helpers. Um, I don't know. I like them all. It's weird. Cause like, you know, you think I'd be most interested in running the manned helpers. And I think that yeah. is a lot of fun, but I also like running the full main line. Um, and the train handling of the coal train is fun, as I mentioned, but then like just the other night I was just for fun. Like I like to operate by myself too. Right. Cause it's yeah, right. time and I don't have people over all the time. So I was switching at Columbia falls and like, it, it's just satisfying to, uh, to mm. do that. So that's yeah. really cool. I don't know. It's all fun. Yeah. Yeah. Outstanding. That's a really cool system you came up with there. I like yeah, that a lot. I, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I might steal. Say. I might steal this for my little my little <laughs> crappy short line railroad because yeah, yeah. I don't really need car cards. I don't really run long. Tra- my my trains are only four cars long. This would be like a perfect little system for me to be able to do something like this. With. Exactly. That's the thing for me is like I mean, there's a few things going on. One like lack of experience, right? So like when I'm trying to design an operating scheme to to forward cars and things like that. Um, and again, I have played around with JMRI enough to like be familiar with it and like make it work for my layout. But I came to realize that my car forwarding needs are simple enough that a scheme like this is bulletproof and like can't screw up. Um, and it's so low maintenance with JMRI. There are things that I would need to recycle and reset and, and I have to like print things out. Um, and in theory, I, I don't know. I, I just like this because I, I have it saved as a document. I can tweak things if I want to, but for the most part, it like it resets itself. And and so, yeah, if I had more operating experience, perhaps there's a better system out there. I know there's a better system out there, um, but this has worked to this point. And I've, I myself, nor has anyone else as they're operating thought like, oh, wow, this is so simple that like, I see through the illusion, right? Um, we use the word immersion. Like we want to be immersed. We don't want to be able to see the logic, right? As we're doing it. And, and I don't think um, that, that comes through when you're operating with this scheme. I still feel like you are more focused on, on the car movements or the, the train movements and you're, you're not, um, right. I don't know. It, it's not like the paperwork or the logic of the system getting in the way. Um, because it's like it's just complicated enough, but but it's also simple enough to to be bulletproof. Yeah. That's I like cool. That. I like it a lot. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah. Uh, I had some more things on here. Basically, just equipment inspiration showing. Like, there's the Columbia Falls local heading out of. Um, well. Columbia Falls. That's the Weyerhaeuser plant in the background. You, but you can see, like, I, I try to keep the uh, the equipment as close to the prototype as possible. So we got a couple of Jeeps there with the the PTC equipment on top. Right. Um, you can see the train makeup very similar, right? A couple of sixty foot high cube box cars, uh, loaded center, center beam. beam. Yeah. It's yeah. all like it's all sort of the same commodities. And and so finally, like, it's taken years, but I feel like the layout actually not just scenically, but but the equipment is is very much uh in place um and, and appropriate for the line so it's it's finally satisfying so yeah. i think that's all i had so i, I guess questions or more yeah questions. that's i mean there's been there's been a lot of questions and i and i will um send it over to the the section crew here in the chat we still got 75 people with us as we traipse into hour three here um and um if you have questions for cam about his layout and the content that we covered. Make sure that you guys are getting them into the chat. I do have a handful written down and we will do a little uh, lightning round here uh, near the end. But Mike, I wanted to shift it back to you for any any comments or questions here um, of what Cam's covered this evening. My brain hurts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I mean... Don't take this the wrong way, Cam. But for being 25 years old and having this level of of perspective and this level of understanding of how seeing 
composition needs to be handled and how you achieve those things. My hat's off to you, man. That is absolutely, this is no, this, I'm not blowing smoke either. This, I tell you something, this is one of the nicest scenic layouts I have seen Thank you. in a long, long time. And I, I, I would love to come down and take a look at it in person one of these Anytime. days. I mean, it would, it would be, you, you said earlier, it's, you know, it's an honor to be on the show. I'll tell you something. The honor is a hundred percent ours, man. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, honestly, th- this is this is absolutely like uh, this is unlike anything I've seen in a long time. Thank I you mean, very much. not a boomer notwithstanding, and and Mike Rose and all these guys that we know and things like that, and Tom Johnson and uh, Klamaski and these guys that. No, I mean they're they're all amazing modelers. For twenty five years old to understand all of this is just <laughs> outstanding to me because I didn't have any concept of these things at that age. Appreciate that is it. that is absolutely killer, man. That's it's amazing. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, I don't I know mean, what else to say. To be honest with you, Andy, I just <laughs> I I really don't. I got nothing. No, that's and. And I think I think the you know I'll I'll echo pretty much um, what what Mike has said is that this is it's truly an, an impressive um, and and as you talk through your your process this evening about how you develop the layout to be immersive and to capture maybe not the exact prototype detail down to the rock you know being two inches to the left of that piece of you know. You know nothing like that to that nature, but <laughs> right. y- you know when when you you look at it and and then you you see everything is in the right place. The trees are you know to scale the 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 backdrop. The colors that you use in the palette to create the backdrop mimics exactly how you would see um, you know the the distant skyline when when you're out there. And then and then to tie in the operations aspect of it of of this the detail that you went into to uh, really understand how trains moved across the line and then capturing well okay now we got the train movements right but we need to get the equipment right too and i think i think that that's a a really important thing you can't have you know equipment from the 40s 50s 60s running around on a layout like this mm. high you know it's high cube box car center beam flats tank cars you know, covered hoppers, a lot of ACFs, you know, those types of things. And then the bathtub gone, you know, guns for the coals and stuff. I think that's, you know, you, you hit it out of the park and, you know, even, even your other layout, you know, the Crawford, you know, Hill was trending in that direction anyway, but (laughs) when you tied in the operational element and that, and I could, you know, just listening to you talk about it, it was almost like there was a bit of, you know, there was a bit of a regret there um, <laughs> with, with that layout. And then oh, as yeah. you came for full circle on, on Mariah's pass, you, it just, it seemed like, like you really dove into the change head first. And, and I have two questions. Um, so the diatribe aside. Um, so changing your layout you know you, you said you you really had some conflict some some friction about it you know you know it's okay to change right how do you feel after or you know where the layout's at now what do you you know what are your feelings towards the hobby towards towards your layout towards operating comparatively to the other layout that you or the, the other version of this layout yeah good question well first mike andy thank you for the kind words i uh I, I'm bad at receiving praise, but it is really appreciated. Um, <laughs> well, it's not just us. Everyone in the yeah, chat. No, I mean, you know, everyone yeah, in the chat yeah, is echoing I, the same sentiment. It's awesome. It, it, it feels good. Um, you know, I, I post stuff a lot, and, and I feel like everything's always very positive and, and encouraging. Um, and, and then, you know, there are times when I question, like, am I just doing this for attention seeking? The answer is no, but uh, it, it does feel good, you know, to, to be validated in person from accomplished modelers like yourself. So thank you. Um, but to answer your question, 
I, yeah, I, I feel like this, you're right. There was a, a degree of not like regret, but just, I, I was like aware as I was building the Crawford Hill layout that I was cutting corners or, or not finishing layout tasks to the level that I would be happy with later. And I think that caught up with me, right? There's almost a bit of remorse where I kind of phoned in the trees. I just, I didn't do my research. I didn't spend enough time thinking about like, how would this look? I'm going to use super trees. I'm going to flock them with, um, with uh, like two millimeter static grass. And that's going to be a ponderosa pine. And like, that is not a bad idea necessarily, but in execution, I didn't really consider the other elements. It's not just like the unit of tree. It's not just, does this look good? It's the density. It's like the placement of them. It's the size, all of that. And I didn't play or spend enough time playing around with those sorts of things with the scenery. Um, and the same could be said for, for the, the operations. And I think that just bugged me enough that it wasn't a satisfying layout. Like I could take a photo here and there and be excited and say, oh, wow, that looks cool. Like if this were someone else's layout, I'd look at that post and go, dang, that's a nice layout. But since I'm the one living it, I'm the one making it, I can't forget about the stuff that I wish I had done differently. And so with this new layout, I made sure that I limited all of those wishes, right? That that moving forward, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the next step wishing that I had tidied something up a bit better on, on a previous step, you know, yeah. things along those lines. So it, it this time around is much more rewarding and it, it's a layout where I've actually been thinking recently um, with an impending move out of state that like for as long as this will be here. And at that point, it's not really in my hands. Cause again, this is, this isn't my, my parents' house cause they allow it to be here <laughs> um, that, you know, if, if it, if it had to go, I'd, I'd be at peace with that. But at the same time, for the first time in years, this is a layout that I'm excited about keeping around, right? Usually I'm so I'm eager to like plan the next thing. I'm like, what's the next layout? I'm always planning, right? Thinking about spaces as I'm looking at apartments. I'm like, oh, this bedroom would be perfect for a model train layout. Um, but with this one, I'm, I'm looking forward to the bench projects and being able to ship stuff home. And uh, anytime I get to visit to just like kind of tweak it, add things to it. And um, I don't think I would have said the same thing about the last version of the layout. I'd be eager to put it behind me in a way. Yeah. So that, that ties in closely with my second question. Um, so, and this was brought up by uh, uh, Luke Robinson very early on in, in the show this evening. And I wrote it down and I wanted to make sure that we captured it. So what happens when you leave? He talks about bench projects, those types of things, um, you know, being, being at your parents' house here. And, and maybe, maybe uh, okay, you, so you have the near term figured out. What are, what's the, you know, what's the, the long-term vision? So, you know, do you would you want to remake this uh in a different footprint this the, you know the yeah. mass pass do you want to try like you know oregon or a different railroad altogether you know what where where is cam neely going yeah um, is, is this a, is that an opportunity to switch the end scale in yeah like yeah. what you were talking about earlier yeah it might be it, i don't know that sort of stuff i'm all figuring out in my head and and in a way I've kind of been pushing it off because I've known for some time now that like I have a very limited amount of time where I can invest a reasonable, um, you know, a reasonable amount of time on the layout. Like I have a, a checklist of things that I want to get done and I have this crazy plan to, to complete the layout in this like 12 month plan. It, I didn't quite get there, but I, I knew that when I set the plan out in a way it's like, this would be insane if I got, even half of this done, but I think I did get half of that done. So that's crazy to me, first of all. And, and so I've tried to stay present to make sure that like th the future is unknown, but I'm here right now in town and, and can work on it. And so yeah. um, I'm yeah. going to do that as much as possible. And I think that's paid off with that said, I still always am scheming and thinking about like, what should <laughs> the next project be? And, and I, I do think that, um, N scale is in my future and I don't know exactly what that means. Um, I, I am entranced by this line and I think 
being able to tackle it again from the get-go would be something that, that would be rewarding and, and that I'd be interested in. But I'm also fascinated by, uh, again, I don't, I can't let go of manned helper operations. I think Montana rail link would be great in N scale with an awesome space. I think you could do a really good, like Mullen pass or, um, Ooh. Mm-hmm. Pass or something. Yeah. I don't know. I've even, Number even in recent days, I was, I was thinking <clears throat> this line just to the West of it, uh, is the, the Kootenai river subdivision, which is like, it's underrepresented and, and very few people model it, but it, it butts up right against this subdivision. Um, and, and if I had like way in the future, if I had the space for it, I think doing an N scale layout that captures sort of that like fast paced, uh, high speed river running, and then the transition into the, the yard operations and then the mountain grade um, up and over Mariah's Pass, that would be super cool to sort of pair the two together to like really give that full experience where it's not just the climb. It's like you're, you're heading from Spokane and now you're like on the wide open rails and, and you have that, that sense of, um, you know, covering space. So I don't it's know. I don't complete journey, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't have the answer, but I do feel like N scales out there for me. I think um, it's going to be more mainline railroading, but in the short term, I could very easily see myself scaling down to a, a more sort of either like modular or uh, like shelf switching kind of layout. Um, I even, yeah, I don't know. So it might be, it's probably going to be scaling down to more like almost diorama focused scale, right? For the next few years, because I'm not going to have a, a layout of this size t- to play with for, for years. Um, but it's fun while it lasts. Yeah, for sure. That was possibly the best answer I could have expected from from that question. That was really, um, <laughs> that was good. Was, I, I thank you. It was kind it of was, a non answer, but <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I and I and I I just posed a um, a question um, back to the to the section crew. Um, so, what do you guys think on on Cam's presentation this evening? Um, did he defend his thesis? Um, <laughs> let us know in the chat. But there is I one, think maybe just a little bit. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a couple more questions here, and then I think what we'll do is we'll tie down for tonight. Um, so, um, tying into those last questions that I was posing, Ron Stanick asks um, thoughts on BNSF taking MRL back. Um, is there a chance of the oil can uh, local run on his layout? Yeah, it's funny uh, you bring that up. I, just recently, I saw that the that the the gas local that MRL runs. They used to have, um, you know, before the BNSF takers, sort of an all white uh, tank car consist. And just recently, they they picked up switched to surely some sort of like Trinity variant black oil car that you'd see on any other sort of. Um, BNSF oil train. So it, it now visually looks very much like the one I run on my layout. Um, so probably not a train like symbol that I would run, but if it went over the Highline subdivision for some reason, then I'd certainly incorporate it, but yeah. um, hopefully that answers it. Yeah. I think, I think that that answers it. Very good. So I think uh, with that, I don't see much coming in the way of uh, questions here um, from the section crew. We are just buttoned up to that three-hour mark, so I do want to take a, a moment to thank Cam um, for, for joining us this evening, fielding the questions. I want to uh, thank the section crew this evening for joining us, uh, 80 strong here, um, all the way to the to the bitter end this evening, and um, thank you for the, the great discussion and the great comments um, and, and questions. You all, if, if there's one big takeaway this evening, um, I, I, I really want to hammer this home. You need to go out to Cam's YouTube channel, um, RailFan220. Uh, subscribe to his his channel and and watch the content there. It's, fan, it's fascinating to see his transformation of his layout uh, over the course of this last year. And this snow shed build 
that he the video that he did was really really good the videos That's are well cool. produced <laughs> the, it, 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 it's very good and the videos are well produced um they're not only you know informative they're entertaining and you get to see more of the layout uh more so than than you got to see on tonight's show so make sure that you guys are out there um and hell tell them that the second section sent you um <laughs> So um, any comments, questions um, about tonight's show, throw them, throw them out there. Uh, you can always email us at secondsectionpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to join uh, more modeling discussions like we had this evening, we're out there on Facebook too, Second Section Podcast. we got a Facebook group out there. It's a fantastic group of modelers answering questions, helping each other out, sharing the hobby. It's unreal and I got to say, Mike, this has been one of our better shows. Oh, my God. Cam, you <laughs> knocked it out of the park. Thank I'll you tell you so what, if this, is, if this was your test run for your thesis defense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those, I think those, I can just send them in the bag. Don't, don't I can just send them this, probably. Yeah, just send them this. So yeah, yeah, forget again, the paper. Yeah, forget the paper. All right, gang, I want to thank everyone um, for, for tuning in this evening. And we will be back in two weeks. Same bat time, same bat channel. Good night, everyone. Night.